Yeah. So the voice says you have two minutes to uh, top off your beverage and grab a snack and sit down for our next presentations, which will start right at 11 o'clock. Okay, if we could have our session two panel come on up front. So calling all panelists, session two. We're going to keep moving forward. We've got at least two or three that will be here personally, and then we've got two that will beam in. So, you know, I always tell my kids, don't talk with your mouth full. And they say, well, my mouth's not full. Well, maybe put something in your mouth. So is this your permission to take a sip of water or take a bite of something? And then that would produce the silence that we're hoping for for our next panel. I know, only a couple of you got that. Okay, so if we're ready to start and we're ready to start, are we ready to start? Okay, Brad, you ready? Yes, we're ready, okay, there we go. Yeah, yeah, busted. All right, so what we're doing now, yes, thank you. All right, so a very important part of being ready for funding projects is having your projects ready to be funded. And the state, the Community Transportation Program has not often been funded. We're gonna talk about encouraging the state to do that during resolution time later in the day. 
uh, it's very likely with the, all the funding that's coming in, that program should see some funding. So we want to make sure communities and tribes and any entity that's eligible for the community transportation plan has got their foot best foot forward. There's also opportunity at the federal level for direct funding of projects. So how do we get ready? And so we're going to take a look at some of the efforts that uh, that John has been doing, working with you and your communities, and then we're we'll start talking. Um, invite our state partners to talk about what's happening at the planning level um, statewide and how it impacts Southeast. And then we're going to um, hear from the multimodal components uh, of, um, of aviation as well as the highways. So uh, looking forward to this session and it's gonna keep getting better and better and better because the next sessions just keep building on and building on and building on. So without any further ado, now that we're ready to get started, I'm gonna turn this over to John Bowling and um, We'll um, go from there. So, John, thank you. You you can take it from here or there. Uh, from here, I guess. There you go. <clears throat> this is the clicker. clicker. All right. Thanks. Good morning. Nice to see you all here. Uh, my name is John Bowling. I work for Southeast Conference on transportation issues and various special projects. Um, I'm here this morning to talk briefly about a summary of work Southeast Conference has done with communities and tribes in the region to on identifying locally important transportation projects in light of the infrastructure bill, right? The IIJA. Uh, my remarks will be brief to ensure that there's uh, more time for our guests from DOTP, Department of Transportation and Public Facilities, who will follow with some uh, important details about, uh, about program funding. Now, the infrastructure bill has certainly given us a lot to think about. Um, it's a complex document. It's over a thousand pages, as I'm sure some of you know whose job it is to review uh, review these things, uh, like me. And uh, um, uh, at a thousand over a thousand pages, it includes seemingly countless programs and billions of dollars in program funding, especially especially for transportation projects. Although it's not limited to that, uh, the scope is remarkable. Uh, roads. Bridges, ferries, culverts, city streets, highways, buses, trains, airports, and harbors are all specifically mentioned in the uh, in the bill, uh, with funding either authorized or appropriated over the course of the uh, of the legislation. In Alaska, it appears that uh, funding from the legislation will amount to about six hundred sixty-four million dollars a year for the next five years, uh, parsed into program categories and subcategories. And that figure does not include program funds for things like the low, low emission electric ferries and the essential ferry service programs, the latter of which is funded, as we were told yesterday, at over a billion, at about a billion dollars for the life of the legislation. Now, Federal Highways reported in December that uh, uh, infrastructure bill funding uh, programs include more funding for what they call uh, municipal and non traditional entities. Um, and um, they included as part of that example, this list here of 11 programs you see uh, up on the screen, uh, the right hand most column, excuse me, left hand most column is a non-exhaustive list of some of those uh, discretionary programs, some of which are maybe well suited for municipalities and tribes and some of which are designed for much bigger projects. And you can see the check marks by the entities that are eligible to apply. So these are the municipal, local, tribal, public authority entities uh, that uh, can make a pitch for funding. So this is a, a remarkable uh, opportunity, a remarkable change from, from past, uh, past years. Well, with uh, that uh, encouragement in mind, the conference initiated a process together from communities and tribes, their preferred transportation projects, the purpose of which is to share those projects with what would be our state and federal funding partners. Um, to make them aware that the communities and tribes have long thought about and planned for transportation projects uh, locally. And uh, the project information sheets that I sent out and that were completed and returned by the communities and tribes prepared uh, are an initial first step to positioning SEC members, regional communities and tribes to uh, uh, designate their locally important projects and participate in this competitive process. So if we go to the, uh, the uh, 
the uh, Excel slide, please, James. So uh, we uh, solicited uh, project uh, nominations from the communities. We received 49 and returned to the solicitation. I built a spreadsheet that gives a little bit of a summary of uh, this, the uh, program or project sponsor, a quick, uh, in column B, a quick summary of the project name, estimated cost in column D, and column E essentially says what the funding is needed for, either design, construction, sometimes one, some, sometimes both, commonly both. Frequently, there's match available, sometimes there's not. And embedded in the spreadsheet, uh, for example, here is it's embedded in the spreadsheet is the actual project information sheet submitted by the community. In this case, it's the City Borough of Sitka for their industrial park project. It includes the narrative under project description, the narrative provided by the community so that the state and federal reviewers can get a good uh, synopsis of the importance of the project to, to the community. Uh, through the description and farther down on the, uh, on the page is a little bit of history on other funding applied for in past years. If you close this one out, James, and uh, go to number uh, 40 on page two. Actually, we want to do uh, Wrangell. So Wrangell submitted quite a few of them, one of which uh, is the barge ramp replacement project, if you click on that one. So we heard about this from uh, Corey Baggin uh, just in the last session about the need to uh, upgrade the project. Wrangell has already taken that to heart and uh, provided a project description here. We can get it up. Okay, well, uh, never mind. Uh, um, anyway, uh, so Wrangell has... Uh, uh, detailed the project and established it as a priority in the community, put a dollar price tag on it, uh, well positioned now to, uh, uh, to uh, eventually get together with a state and federal review agency to, uh, to petition for funding. And I hope that these uh, sheets will be a springboard to uh, applying to the agencies for the various discretionary and programmatic funds that'll come over the next five years. I enjoyed working with the communities on the project. And on that note, um, I'm let's turn to our uh, new next speakers from the State of Alaska Department of Transportation. First up, as according to, to the agenda, is Mr. Eric Taylor, who's involved with long-term planning with DOT to tell us about uh, his efforts uh, and DOT. Mr. Taylor. Well, thank you. Can you hear me now? Okay. Good morning, uh, Eric Taylor. I'm with the Department of Transportation and Public Facilities. I work in the uh, Headquarters Program Development and Statewide Planning Office here in Juneau. And my responsibility is uh, to manage the update of the statewide long range transportation plan and freight plan. And uh, I also manage the transit program. Um, these, the long range transportation and a uh, freight plan is something we update usually every uh, five years. I understand with IIJA, they're gonna modify the freight plan update to four years now. Um, but the, the purpose of this plan is to provide direction for the statewide long range planning. And so it tends to be what we call an umbrella plan. Uh, it doesn't discuss projects in particular, it's a policy uh, level plan. And our thrust uh, these days is to go into a performance planning framework. And how that relates to projects, which is usually where what uh, communities and regions are more interested in, is any project that comes up um, for consideration, uh, which then feeds into, uh, we're gonna discuss later, the, the uh, statewide transportation improvement program, is that it must comply with the or must be in accord with the policies or, or the direction that's in the statewide long range transportation plan. So that's the relationship. We want to, we, we do this long range planning to try and make sure that the policies that we have um, are providing di sufficient direction so that when you submit projects, um, they, they're in accordance uh, with that policy direction that the state's going. Um, so with that introduction, I'm going to 
go ahead and introduce um, Wendy Wilbur, who is our consultant for the current update of the statewide long range plan. Uh, we're hoping to finish up this particular project uh, with a completed plan in August of this year. And Wendy is our consultant with uh, Kittleson and Associates, and she's managing the project team. Thank you, Eric. I trust everyone can see my screen okay? Yes? Okay, great. Uh, thanks for having us today. Um, Eric gave a nice introduction to the long range transportation plan. I'm gonna quickly go over some highlights of the transportation plan and the freight plan element of that. And I'm also going to encourage all of you to visit the webpage, take the online survey and continue to pro provide us feedback on that. So it's easy for us to think about transportation today, what our existing needs are, but the long range plan is really focused on the future. And I think this is just inherently a little bit hard for us, especially right now through COVID and, and all of the different changes going on. But really this long range plan acknowledges past trends, but it also recognizes that the past trends may not necessarily be predictive of the future. So this is a forward looking plan for the transportation system to think about what's coming. It's thinking about a transportation system for the next generation. And like I said, we're completing this during a pandemic. We're completing it during a time when there's a significant new infrastructure bill that greatly impacts the next five years. So I think it's a little more of a challenging time to be planning and I think our crystal ball might be just a little bit murkier than usual. But there's no doubt there's a lot of emerging technology coming our way as uh, I think a bright spot in all of this. So to set the stage for the long range transportation plan, we've been asking a lot of what could happen questions. These are questions that will help us better be better prepared to seize opportunities and to manage risk. So many of these what if questions are organized around the economy, funding, and the workforce. For example, if we just wanna look at the Alaska Marine Highway System, we know there's workforce shortages nationwide. How do we plan for that? How do we put policies and actions in place to mitigate that risk? We also know there's advancements in the use of electric ferries. We know there's a lot of money for electrification and the new infrastructure bill. How can we maximize those opportunities? So really, as we go through this plan, Alaska Moves 2050, we're going to outline goals, policies, and specific actions and investment strategies that will help to create a more adaptable and resilient transportation system a system that will serve all Alaskans, businesses, visitors far into the future. As Eric said, it's a policy document and it will not identify specific projects. The planning effort is being developed through a series of technical memorandum that we've issued. They're all available on the website and through meetings with a statewide advisory committee, a freight advisory committee, a lot of stakeholder interviews and outreach like this. So it's also based in performance-based planning, as Eric mentioned. And this is really defining where the Alaska Department of Transportation wants to go, and then actually monitoring those outcomes. We measure what matters, right? So it's not going to be so onerous that it can't be monitored, but we want to make sure that the Department of Transportation and the public can see specific actions and how progress is being made toward those. So I did want to just briefly highlight the first survey that we did in the summer of 2021. It resulted in two, about 2,500 responses. We're pretty proud of that. And they came across from across all areas of the state. Through that, Alaskans highlighted their travel patterns, their concerns, and their top priorities. And again, like I said, in addition to the public survey, we've hosted presentations, we've conducted one-on-one -on -one interviews. Through all of this outreach, some key themes really keep emerging. Maintain what we have, take care of it, make sure it's in good shape, make it more resilient and sustainable. We know that the needs exceed the available funding. 
We recognize we may have to subsidize rural Alaska. Alaska is unique and it's big and there's a lot of barriers. We need to take care of all Alaskans. And of course, I would be remiss if I didn't pull out some highlights from Southeast Alaska, who to no surprise prioritized ferry service, the need for sustainable funding, and again, maintenance of what we already have. So through this process, goals were developed, working with the Department of Transportation staff, the statewide advisory committee, the freight advisory committee, and the public. The goals are focused around safety and mobility for all Alaskans, improve the accessibility, safety, and personal mobility, and the interconnectedness. So keeping Alaska's connect, keeping, keeping Alaskans connected has been really a key theme. Management of the system, improve operational efficiencies and safety. And these apply to all modes. These apply to aviation, to our highways, to our marine system, to freight. This is for all modes, people walking, biking, and taking the bus. Operation and maintenance of the system, start to consider full life cycle costs. If we build it or buy it, can we maintain and operate it? Resiliency, we want to assess the risk and we want to invest in solutions that make Alaskans more resilient, our transportation system more resilient. Next is coordination and collaboration. Everyone can always do better at communication. I think this is a goal in every plan. Sustainable funding, we need a stable, diverse, and long-term funding source. I'm going to talk a little bit more about that at the end of the presentation. Performance-based management, data-driven, evidence-based decision-making. Invest where it's needed the most. Transportation in innovation, identify national trends, and don't forget about local innovations. Alaskans are scrappy. There's a lot of really good work going on. So we need to be celebrating that and building on those local innovations and sharing those best practices with other states. And finally, economic vitality. Invest in transportation infrastructure that facilitates economic growth. So these goals are part of the public survey that's out right now and asking Alaskans to help prioritize which ones are most important to them. Next, we kind of come back to those what if questions I originally talked about. We're also using an exploratory scenario planning process to look at alternative possible futures. So scenario planning is really about having robust discussions. It informs, but it does not dictate strategic courses of actions. It really just helps the planning team identify policies and actions that can make the system more resilient to a wide variety of uncertain, but possible, plausible future conditions. What kinds of scenarios do we need, or what kinds of transportation systems do we need in each scenario? What investment strategies or policies might be needed? How will transportation revenue be impacted? And how might the Department of Transportation's structure, business processes, or capabilities need to change? So, we came up with three plausible futures. They're pretty standard in long range planning, but full speed ahead. Under this scenario, we're imagining a strong economy, population growth, a robust workforce. We've got plenty of funding for capital projects as well as maintenance and operations. And there's a faster ado adoption of technology and how it's changing our transportation needs. We're also looking at cruising. That's kind of status quo where we're at today. And I think it was, um, someone pointed out, cruising in Alaska has a little bit of ups and downs. We have, it's not just super level, but under cruising, we have low to moderate economic and population growth. Federal spending is reduced. State match is a little bit harder to come up with to leverage that federal funding. And there's a slower adoption of technology. And then finally, we have powering down stagnant and declining economic and population growth. Funding continues to be reduced at a greater rate. And again, that slower adoption of technology. So this is helping us frame those policies and actions to seize opportunities and to manage risk. 
And because the policies and actions must take into account funding, we need money to build it, buy it, operate it, and maintain it. The challenge with transportation funding is it's often described as being restricted to silos. This means that our funds come from different sources and have very specific legal conditions for how, when, and where they can be spent and who can even spend them. Federal transportation dollars are distributed via programs for highways, transit, ferries, research, rural aviation, and the international aviation system, or it's through competitive grants. But as we all know, federal dollars have rules on what you can spend it on, and it also has a lot of regulations that guide the dis planning, design, and construction, which can slow down the delivery of projects. So the new federal funding is very exciting, and it provides tremendous opportunities to jumpstart important transportation improvements. But it's a short-term five-year solution. We don't know what's going to happen in five years. Will there be additional sources of revenue to operate and maintain any of in the investments that we make? The challenge with federal dollars is it can't be used to maintain or operate the end result. We have to have state dollars for that. We also have to have state dollars for operations and maintenance. So if you talk to the operation and maintenance staff, they like the state dollars the most because it's flexible, it's fast, and it can keep our system resilient, reliable, and cleared of snow. But we also need those state funds, not just for operation and maintenance, but also for matching dollars to get the federal funds. For every $1 of state money, we get nine in federal dollars. It's a pretty good return on investment. What we do know is there's not enough money to take care of all the transportation needs today or into the future right now. With limited funding, Alaskans face difficult choices about what takes priority. Our communities rely on many different ways of getting around and investing more money in one mode of transportation has different impacts for different people. So the challenge of this long range transportation plan is to prepare for an uncertain future find that balance and deliver a robust, healthy Alaska or have Alaska Department of Transportation deliver a robust system for all Alaskans. So what's next? We have the public survey open. That's gonna help us refine, refine the policies and actions. And we will have a draft plan out for public review in early May. So the last slide has ways to contact us. AlaskaMoves2050.com is an easy link to get to the survey. And of course, you can always contact Eric or myself to um, provide comments. So if you find the survey too constrictive, send us an email. We're happy to take comments any way that we can get them. Thank you. Thank you, Wendy. Appreciate it. Um, let's uh, move on now. Uh, well, just to recap, looks like in May 2022, there'll be an opportunity for public review and comment on the long range 2050 plan. So we'll look forward to that. Um, let's move on now to um, um, uh, Christy McNally with State DOT. She works uh, more in the near term uh, on SIP, Community Transportation Program and Transportation Alternative Programs. Uh, and she'll tell us uh, about the mechanics of that process and um, and hopefully some kind of a tie to the infrastructure bill. So, uh, uh, Chrissy, are you ready? Yeah, can everybody hear me? Loud and clear. Great, yeah, I'm Chrissy McNally. I'm the Service Transportation Planner for DOT's Juneau Field Office. And I'm gonna share my screen here. Just give me confirmation that you can see that. Yes, yeah, we can see it. Great, thank you. So as most of you probably know, South, uh, the South Coast region is responsible for planning for Southeast Alaska, along with the Aleutians and Kodiak. Um, real quick, thank you, Wendy, for that great um, synopsis of the long range transportation plan. I'm probably gonna be a little repetitive with some of that, but hopefully provide some new information. 
So in relation to the long range transportation plan, we do anticipate following that plan with the Southeast Alaska transportation plan update, which is really exciting. I know it's been long awaited. We expect to begin that process um, in the fall of this year. And we're gonna start with a stage one, basically identify current conditions, gaps in the system, needs, recommendations, and some of that will be influenced by the results of the long range transportation plan. Um, we'll also do an analysis of you know, major system changes that have occurred since the last adopted plan in 2004. There, there was an, um, an update conducted in 2014, but that wasn't adopted. So our last adopted plan was quite some time ago. So that's really exciting and um, something to look forward to in the fall. So I'll speak briefly about our statewide transportation improvement plan. Again, this is our short to medium range planning document. It's a, a four year program. It is a federally required in order to receive federal funds. And it lists all of our federal programs and projects that are federally funded. So the, the STIP it must be fiscally constrained, meaning it's, it's not a wish list. We need to expect to have enough funding for the projects that are in the STIP. And it's a, it's a highly public process. It goes out for any time there's a change or an update, it all goes out for public notice. And it does need to be approved by the Federal Highway System, Federal Highway Administration, and the Federal Transit Administration. And state regulations do distribute the federal funding and define programs in our state regulations. And those include the National Highway System, the Alaska Highway System, the Community Transportation Program, and TRAC, which I won't touch on too much. We'll get into a subset of, of that program, the Transportation Alternative Program, um, which is more relevant to communities. So the STIP process starts with identifying a need. And sometimes that happens internally through data analysis, through discussions with our maintenance and operations crews. Uh, but it also comes from communities. and we put all of our needs that are identified into our needs list and they get a unique need ID. Uh, we keep track of funding availability and what each project, what type of funding each project is eligible for. So that when there is a call for projects, we have a list of projects ready to go and put together project nomination packages that will go to the project evaluation board. And that may result in, in a whole new step, a new four-year step, or potentially go in as amendments to the existing step. And as you can see, we're currently working from the 2020 to 2023 step. And you can follow that link there, and that will give you more information about the step. If you ever have any questions about any projects or need help interpreting the step, um, you can always contact our office. We're happy to walk people through, it can be a little tricky to um, interpret all the information. So this is really broadly the national distribution of the eight apportioned programs for federal aid. And as you can see, the National Highway Performance Program is obviously the largest program. We have two new programs under IIJA, the Carbon Reduction Program and the Protect Program. For the purposes of this discussion, we'll just focus on the STBG program. That's the um, State Transportation Block Grant. And you can see how this plays out for Alaska on this next slide. It's, it's a little bit busy. Um, you can see IIJ did change some of the distributions and it did add new programs, but not all the programs grew at the same rate. So the STBG, which is the orange, block there in FY21 and FY22, that grew about 14%. And for the purposes of, of this discussion, two programs that are of interest to communities come out of this um, funding source. 
and that's the Community Transportation Program and the Transportation Alternatives Program. So from our regulations, the community transportation program should serve a local need. It doesn't necessarily need to be locally owned, but it should serve a public need. And that means that the state can submit projects. So DOT can submit projects as a sponsor along with political subdivisions. So if there is an advocacy group, an interested constituency, they just need to go through their elected officials, contact DOT in order to get a project nominated. And the transportation alternatives program is uh, similar in process. However, DOT cannot be a sponsor. So that needs to come directly from the communities. And that's for things like bike paths, any kind of pedestrian bicycle accommodation, along with some other things. But most commonly, they funded uh, bike and pedestrian paths. So when there is a call for projects, it's broken up into a couple of phases. And this is going to be a little bit different this time around. We do anticipate a this process beginning later this year. And so the criteria for evaluating projects will be in draft form. That will go out for public notice and public comment. And that will be about a one to two month period. Something new, but should be really helpful, is there will be a notice of intent to apply. And so we'll be conducting regional outreach. It'll be on the online public notice site along with Gov Delivery. And communities who wish to eventually submit um, a nomination will be required to first submit this notice of intent to apply. The second phase of the call for projects, the, the final product evaluation criteria will be set once all the comments have been received through the public process. And then there'll be the formal call for project nomination packages. Again, there will be regional outreach project sponsors. Um, we'll also have the list of projects from our notice of intent to apply. And so the project sponsors will be advised by DOT. It'll definitely be a collaborative effort because we'll really want projects to be successful. So we'll help develop those application packages, develop a thorough scope schedule estimate so that communities can have a realistic idea of what kind of match is gonna be required. And then we'll also just help identify any other data that could be useful in the project nomination, such as um, traffic data, crash data, pavement, bridge condition data, et cetera. There's plenty of others. So this is the longest process, part of the process. This could you know, take up to six months to give people time to put together a thorough package. And then once all that closes, all the nominations will go to the project evaluation board. And this is a one to two day meeting and there is call in information. It's, it is a very public process and the evaluators will use the criteria that was established to evaluate the projects. There will be opportunities for public involvement throughout the meeting. And then the projects will be scored and ranked and a few other items will be considered to uh, flesh them out a bit more, such as fiscal constraint of the project, project development timeline, and what is in the state's best interest. And the justifications, the scoring, the notes from this meeting will all be available to the public. And as you can see here, the PEB consists of directors from the three regions, Northern, Central, and South Coast and the Director of Program Development and Statewide Planning, and the Director of Statewide Design and Engineering Services, and one Deputy Commissioner. So this is a nice visual of what that process looks like. It is a roughly 15 to 16 month process, and with the major steps being the creation of the criteria, finalizing the criteria, the call for projects, and the PEB. So most importantly, how do you get your project funded? First, just we need to know about it. So with the effort that John and Southeast Conference has done with compiling all these projects, we can take those, um, do a review, see if any of them are already in our needs list. 
And if any follow-ups needed with communities, we can go from there. If you didn't have a chance to take part in that process with Southeast Conference, we're always available to discuss potential projects and see what type of funding they're eligible for and get it into our needs list if it's not already there. And that's, that's really the first step. And we can also advise people on how to take steps ahead of funding opportunities to make sure that when funding opportunities do become available, your project's going to be really competitive. When it relates to the CTP and the TAP, it's great if you can get your project into a local plan, whether that's a comprehensive plan, an economic development plan, any kind of transportation plan, and to call it out specifically. And other demonstrations of public support, whether that's a resolution, letters of support from the community. It's also good to work out where your match will come from. And another reason why it's really important to have a good estimate of the project cost, because you wouldn't want your match to change too much once there's been a commitment. And then it's also good to identify whether the community is gonna plan to take over maintenance of the facility. Uh, this could, criteria will change from the previous time for a call for projects for CTP, but it's always good if a community plans to take over maintenance once the facility has been developed or improved. And to, to conduct a cost benefit analysis and other, and other project specific studies that could help um, influence the estimate, create the best scope, such as a transportation impact analysis, things like that. So we can help walk you through that whole process. So please feel free to reach out our planning chief, Marie Heidemann, myself, Chrissy McNally, Paul, who you'll hear from next, our aviation planner, and Joanne Schmidt, our Southeast area planner. So hopefully that is helpful. Uh, I'll be available for any questions once the panel has wrapped up and thank you so much. Thank you, Chrissy. Yeah, if you could stay online uh, till the end of the panel in case there are questions, I'd appreciate it. Thank you. Sure. Great, thanks again. All right, uh, very good. Let's move on please now to uh, Mr. Paul Kira, who deals with uh, aviation planning for Alaska DOT. Uh, Paul, please begin. Okay, hello. My name is Paul Kara. I'm the aviation planner for the uh, South Coast region. And I'm going to parallel Chrissy's stellar uh, presentation a little bit, uh, talk to you about how we get projects into aviation. Uh, aviation's always been a, a well-taxed industry and there's always been some money. And uh, now with this new infrastructure bill, the money has essentially doubled. So the infrastructure bill alone is an additional $25 billion. And that's nationwide. I don't know what Alaska's share is, but word has it that um, our legislators in Washington, D.C. took care of us. So easy to remember, 5, 5, 15. 5 billion is for air traffic control facilities, 5 billion for terminals, and 5 billion for all the other stuff. Okay. Hmm. There we go. Okay, so for air traffic facilities, for Southeast, what's really important to remember is that AWOS, Automated Weather Observation System. And if you've been looking at the airplanes flying in Southeast, they used to be Piper Cherokees, Cessna 207s. They're becoming Pilatus, uh, Cessna Caravans, some pretty high-end aircraft. And then the Medevacs with their high-end sophistication, these are multi-million dollar aircraft. And they have pretty good capabilities and they can fly down in instrument conditions, which increases the utility of the whole air transportation system here in Alaska. And it allows you to get to where you're going instead of waiting for the weather to get better. Um, but to do that, to fly instruments on an air carrier to an airport, you have to have a meteorologist on the ground, or you could have an automated weather observation system. And so the FAA is providing those and uh, hopefully we get some more of those in Southeast Alaska and it'll increase utility here. As far as the airports, uh, terminal buildings, uh, Randy uh, spoke a little about Ketchikan, uh, a little bit about um, Southeast Alaska is their um, 
Alaska, I'll back up a little bit. In Alaska in general, the whole state of Alaska, DOT with its 237 airports other than Anchorage and Fairbanks, we only own one terminal. It's in Skagway and it's for sale. Uh, those terminal buildings in Sitka and in Ketchikan actually belong to the <clears throat> Ketchikan Gateway Borough and the Sitka uh, City and Borough of Sitka. Uh, and we are, <clears throat> are in co-sponsorship with them. Uh, we work with them for the funding. And this funding does come with strings attached. Uh, we both end up on the hook for the strings attached part of it. The FAs, the one writing the checks, and they want to make sure that that money is going back into the airport, back into aviation. Uh, so that's kind of uh, an area of discovery that we don't know too much about, but I can tell you that uh, we used to in the United States have the best airport terminals in the world. And since then, uh, you look at Frankfurt, Beijing, uh, Istanbul, uh, Abu Dhabi, they've all made these huge palace, these Taj Mahal terminals. And the United States is falling far behind. And this has been a matter of debate for the past three presidents. So I could see where they're adding some money into this. And one of the features of these terminals and also the power systems for the air traffic control system is uh, improve energy efficiency. Aviation has been tagged as being a major contributor to climate change. We have jets flying up in the stratosphere, dumping uh, burnt materials into the sky. And so the FAA is on the initiative to try to make uh, mitigate that by using sustainable power systems for their air traffic control facilities and the terminals. Uh, guess what we have here in Juneau, a lot of hydropower. So that may be opportunity possibly. Okay. So the last part is everything else, $15 billion. And that's mostly what we work with here at Alaska DOT. And that's your runways, your taxiways, everything else, the navigation aids, whatever else is in there. And if you look at that, that's $3 billion per year for the next five years and 2.39 billion of that is going to primary airports and only 500 million to non-primary airports. So what are primary airports? Uh, 10,000 employments per year. An employment is a passenger getting on to a commercial carrier uh, and leaving town. Here in Southeast Alaska, we have seven primary airports, which by the way, Juneau is not our, it belongs to the city of Juneau. It's not Alaska DOT airport, but uh, we work with them. And then you'll see we have three airports that are right on the edge uh, every year. Sometimes they make primary status, sometimes they don't. And it makes a huge difference in the amount of entitlement funds we get for those airports. Uh, last in 2019, uh, we had 9,700 employments in Gustavus and the airport manager was pretty keen on knowing who flies into the airport and talk to the smaller carriers ask them to report their employments to the FAA, which they did, and it brought Gustavus up to primary status. Uh, we certainly need the money in Gustavus. We've repaved it and reconfigured it, and we're looking to add a new building uh, for the fire truck and the snow removal equipment and that uh, other maintenance items. Important lesson there is Air carriers, if there's any in here, report your employments. And these, of course, are pre-COVID numbers. COVID 2020, all the numbers went down by almost half. Um, they're coming back up. I'm going to go now that we've talked about where this money is, is into how a project originates. And it's similar to the, what Chrissy just talked about. It starts with a need. And the needs usually come from within our organization. We inspect our airports. We look for shortcomings within the airport. The FAA inspects our uh, airports where Alaska Airlines flies and they point out areas where we need improvement. We also get needs from people like you, airport stakeholders that tell us certain things that we don't know about. We can't see everything. And so it's important, it, it's good to know what our needs are. And we get them from all sources we can and we document. We have a database where we keep those. And then we take the priority needs, highest priority being safety and security always, and we turn those needs 
uh, a certain amount for every year into project nominations. And steps to develop a project nomination, it starts off with uh, a scope. And uh, these are very important that we write down what it is exactly that we're going to do. And then we have to write a justification. Why is it that we have to do that? Uh, the FAA is pretty strict on where we spend our money. And then we also have an airport project evaluation board, APEB. Similar to the PEB, it's APEB. Um, they wanna know why should we give you the money for, all, for this project? Why is it so important? And we add to this project nomination any supporting documentation we have, pictures, safety history, the economics of the airport that it brings, the importance of the airport to the community, uh, any studies we have for that. There is, uh, if we have a master plan for the airport, we take those parts from the master plan that are relevant to that project to show the need for that and why it's important to have this project. And we certainly do not want to have a project that is not supported by the local community. So we usually, you'll get a call from one of us asking for a support resolution for a certain project. And it's not limited to that. If there is an airport stakeholder that supports the project, we'll gladly take a letter from that person. Uh, we had uh, a series of airports we're trying to resurface. And uh, I talked to one of the aircraft operations owners, and he described to me the problems he's having at each runway. I wrote a summary of the interview, document, uh, had him sign for it, and brought that to the APEB. Uh, it went over well. So it, it's, it's good to have the feedback. And we also need to have an engineering cost estimate. At this point, the engineers don't know exactly how much is, this is going to cost, but they get a pretty good idea. They have their system, and that tells the APEB, how much money this is going to cost. And first of all, why do we want it? And yeah, and it's going to cost this much money. So they review the whole thing and then they rank it all by score. Um, so they score the projects and the highest scoring projects are the ones that um, get funded first. If they don't meet a certain score, they usually get put down into never, never land and never really make reality unless we can find some new reason new justification to bring them back. Uh, so that can get tricky. There's a number of projects that we just never really can fund. Um, and also once a project has a program date, uh, sometimes money gets moved around. If a certain airport falls into a river somewhere in the state, they have to use that money for uh, that airport, it may delay another project. What's more likely to happen is a project is delayed because of an environmental concern. They find a soil contamination or they get in there and they do the scoping. They find that uh, there's more to this project than they thought. So um, th the other thing to note is some of you have approached me and shown me that your airport has maybe $200,000 in entitlement money this year. And I just wanna clarify that what the state does is it takes all that money and it pools it. Uh, we could easily have a $30 million project. And to do that, we have to take everybody's money and channel it to where it's most important. So with that said, once the project is programmed and it has a date inside the spending plan, the engineers can start in earnest on the design and they can go out there and they can start doing their scoping visit uh, they can, uh, they usually see what kind of soil the airport is on, uh, the stability of it, the sub base, that type of thing. Uh, you start with the environmental work. And if the project, everything's going good, knock on wood, uh, we can start advertising the project out to bid, provided all the design and all the design review and everything else is done. And, uh, Sometimes it doesn't quite work that way. Sometimes we have to bring the project back to evaluation because the cost end up, ends up doubling. So there are delays and you have to be patient. Um, but in any case, once a project is out to bid and the contract is awarded to a contractor, uh, we have our design or our construction engineers working with them to make sure that whoever takes on this project and builds it, be it a runway or whatever it is, that it is follows the standards and the specifications that we set forth. So I think I am done 10 minutes early.
and it's just before lunch, but I'm happy to entertain questions. Oh, I better give you my contact information. Uh, if you don't uh, get your question answered here, I'm going to be around for the rest of the day, or you can email me. Okay, well, we got the whole panel there. So if you got a question, we've got uh, we've got nine minutes. So, Mr. Leach. Thanks. I have a question on uh, the aviation front, and I John Leach from Sitka. I promise this isn't about our airport parking either. Um, I, I'm going to reach back to my my pilot days here, but um, something that uh, stands out for me a lot in Southeast Alaska is we're a lot of see and avoid flying, and there's not really any radar coverage anywhere. And um, as far as ground-based navigation systems, we're moving past the days of uh, you know, radio-based signals, ILSs, things like that. We're going to GPS, RMP, RNF. Um, but without radar coverage, um, it's a big safety concern. But now we have uh, ADS, uh, the ADSB in and out, and that's becoming a requirement in controlled airspace. Planes need to have that. But we've got a lot of, uh, I'll just call them bush pilots, people that have, you know, planes with minimal equipment. But that small investment for those pilots can be a great safety measure. Um, except those ground-based stations aren't very much available, at least what I've seen in Southeast Alaska yet. So as these, uh, as we're addressing airport infrastructure and with some of the broadband money coming, I don't know what we can tap into, but is there a way to put more ADSB ground-based stations or have you been looking at that, discussing that, to see if that's a, a safety measure they can provide for navigation around Southeast? Uh, that would be with the $5 billion pot of money the FA has. And uh, they would be the ones to ask, but the FA has been pretty good to us in Alaska. A lot of that ADSB under the capstone program was put into all those planes, uh, all those glass cockpits you see in the aging old Cessna 207s. Those are compliments of the FAA. Uh, so uh, I can see more of that happening. And yes, I mean, the, the ground-based radio navigation systems are going away for the satellite stuff, but that also needs those... Um, augmentation systems that are on the ground and you're going to see possibly more of that okay. next question oh jeff good from the city and borough of ringle um we had our big windstorm this past winter <laughs> knocked out power to the airport and we lost it for probably four or five hours um we were told and we, we've been trying to work uh with, with all of your folks for the, the past couple of years of getting a backup generator to the airports, but we're being told that those are going to be taken away from all the airports now. The backup generation is not going to be there. But our concern, especially in a remote community with the power going out, if we did have to medevac somebody, how do we do that? How do we get backup power to the to the airport? So we're trying to partner, see if we can do something. But um, except if they're going with all the communities, just how do we provide the backup power to those sites? Uh, it's a good question. Um, I, I think maybe the uh, one of the justifications is how often does the backup generator need to be used? If it's a one-time deal, um, those generators are very expensive to obtain. And, and of course, we can get the money from the FAA for the generator, but that takes away money from maybe a, a runway or something like that. And then the cost of maintaining those, that is on the general fund of the state of Alaska, and they're not inexpensive to maintain. You have to keep them up and you have to test them every uh, like every month, twice, you have to test them and run them. Um, and they use a lot of fuel when they, you do have to use them. So uh, I think a start would be maybe to show a, a need by saying how often do we actually have the power go out to where we need a generator just for the airport. Um, right now, the DOT stance is, is that um, when they start to fall offline, we're not going to replace them. So Chrissy, you, you mentioned the word match on some of these programs. What, what is that typically? And is that ever provision to be waived or should communities be talking to appropriators about providing for that? Yeah, it can vary. Um, typically what we see is a nine to 10% match required. Other programs do require a 20% match. And so in general though, it's, between a nine and ten percent match and so communities can work on waivers for that and so it, it's really um 
project specific and it is situational, but it's it's best to plan for a nine to 10% match for a project that you have identified a need for. John, any closing thoughts for the panel? Uh, just a thank you for DOT's participation. I'm grateful for that. Um, coming up at uh, midday, well, a lot of these federal programs, the infrastructure bill programs, um, will require, especially the discretionary programs, will require benefit cost analysis. And uh, we'll have uh, our friends from HDR here during the noon hour sponsoring our lunch to address that very issue, how to approach these uh, benefit cost analysis, uh, tips, uh, pointers, um, ways to make your application more effective. So I'd encourage everyone to uh, stick around during that sponsored uh, time and uh, listen to our uh, the expert HDR staff go over the dynamics of that. All right, and this is gonna be a working lunch, so get prepared, prepared to both learn and exercise. I hope we're looking forward to this. So a uh, word of thanks to uh, HDR again for their sponsorship and for the panel. So thank you. Okay, are we ready? You know, one of the amazing things about the last three days has been the quality of this food that's here. Would you all give a round of applause for Smokehouse Catering, please? These guys have been absolutely amazing. Thank you. You know, and that's why, I don't know, um, there's a few folks here from, uh, from Central Council, but I tell you, Customer service is a theme that runs all the way through their staff and through their organization. And we just so appreciate the partnership. So thank you all. And thank you to HDR for sponsoring the lunch. And, you know, it's one of those things where the conversation came out of our transportation committee. And those of you that are members know that uh, that's where a lot of the work gets done is right there in committee. And so as we start engaging on these things, or it's like, okay, well, we could do this and we could do that. We've got these resources and like, you know, how about we put together a lunch program for you? And I'm like, wow, okay. And then she brings these guys from uh, Washington, D.C. and New York. And I'm like, okay, we got some we got some firepower here. So you guys, we got to drain every bit of information out of them as, uh, as much as we can. And this is going to be an engaging, interactive time. So we really appreciate the opportunity to um, get these resources to every single community. Because uh, there's quite a few. We've got from Saxman all the way up to Haines Skagway and around to Yakutat uh, represented in here today. And uh, this is exactly the type of um, uh, work and resources that Southeast Conference tries to bring together each year. So thanks to all of you that have made it happen for being here. And without any further ado, I'm just gonna turn it over to you and let you introduce the team and keep on going. Thank so thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. Thank you, Southeast Conference, for the opportunity to share HDR's grant preparedness expertise. And thank you to all of you for attending a third day, but also for your daily work. You guys work so hard to create economic opportunities for Southeast Alaska, and thank you. I'm Aura Landau, Transportation Planner with HDR. HDR, for those of you who are not familiar with us, provides infrastructure development services across the infrastructure lifecycle. 
We offer support in planning, financial strategy, engineering, environmental services, construction administration, and program management. And HDR is a multinational firm. Uh, we've worked on hundreds in, of projects in Alaska in large and small communities. Uh, we've worked from Juneau to Ketchikan to Anchorage to Bettles to Unalaska, including many smaller Southeast Alaska communities, Angoon, Haines, Gustavus, Petersburg, again, Ketchikan, many other kinds of projects. <clears throat> and the projects we work on include roads and highways, ports and shoreside facilities, <clears throat> rail, water systems, energy projects, resiliency, and resource development. So we bring technical expertise across many sectors and geographic uh, focus here in Alaska with our Alaska team. I've lived here in Juneau for over 20 years, and I am really, really excited for our region, for Alaska, uh, with the potential for federal grants. They're going to uplift all of our Alaskan communities, and, and particularly here in the region. I'm kind of like a home country girl, like, we got to get some in Southeast Alaska, right? So um, states, DOTs, and communities around the country are, like you, anticipating availability of the infrastructure grants and asking questions like, what local needs can we fund? What does it take to be competitive for grants? What am I signing up for if I win these grants, then win this funding? And so with me here today, I'm gonna go ahead and advance the slide if you don't mind, please. I don't have the clicker with me. Okay, thank you. Okay, next one, please. Okay, so with me here today are two of HDR's national experts in infrastructure fi financing and advisory services, and they're here to tell you that these upcoming transportation grant cycles are manageable for organizations of all sizes, and it's not too late to get yourself organized for applications and then grant management. So, Nate, go ahead and introduce yourself. Yeah, Nate Masick. Try, try it now. Nate Masick, Infrastructure Finance Director for HDR. I'm based in our Washington, D.C. office and pleased to be here. I look forward to talking with all of you. And I'm Chris Latuso, Advisory Services Director for our Transportation Business Group. My first time in Alaska, so I'm very happy to be here. And I'm going to explain a little more about what advisory services is in a little bit. So hold on. Okay, so we're going to do a couple of uh, points in the presentation here where we want to get some information from you and give you a chance to think about these ideas and how they might apply to your communities and your projects. So you're going to put down your forks for a second, and um, you can go to menti.com on your smartphone, and what we're going to do is uh, give you a, a question or two to answer here. Okay, grab your smartphone, menti.com. You can also use the QR code there on the screen and you'll enter the code 70014663. And the question there is, what is your favorite dessert? So warm you up there. So it's 70014663. That's the wrong word. <laughs> Creme brulee. <laughs> there we go, ice cream. I did this once and somebody said whiskey. <laughs> Apple pie, meat. <laughs> Yay, Southeast. <laughs> okay. Fabulous chocolate cake. <laughs> Booze and meat. Who are you? I want to know who you are. <laughs> Flan. Okay, so that's how we'll use this online polling tool a couple of times during the presentation here today. And then the real question here is, uh-oh, those are not questions about discretionary grants. <laughs> <laughs> okay, go ahead. <laughs> Transportation for buses and facilities. So what questions do you have about grants? We're going to talk about discretionary grants, what some of them are, how to apply for them, what's involved in them. So what kind of questions do you have? How do I get a grant? Right. <laughs> Transportation for buses and facilities. What other questions do you have about transportation grants? You can go ahead and pop them in there. What we've been hearing... Yeah, what strings are attached? That's a really big question, right? Um, you know, the grants are not the same as just, you, you know, uh, um, an appropriation. So, okay, who is eligible to apply? Great. I'm not seeing the ones on the bottom, so no questions. Okay, wonderful. Well, we will get to some of those questions as we go through our presentation today with an overview of the grant programs, best practices, what a BCA is, grant readiness. And I'm going to ask Nate to come up and keep us going. 
Okay, well, thank you very much, Aura. It's great to be here and uh, looking forward to talking this afternoon about federal grant programs. Uh, and we'll talk about some best practices here and about BCAs. Um, in my section of the presentation here. So first, we just want to set the stage a little bit about federal transportation grants and um, just a couple terms that are that are helpful here in thinking about this. First of all, there's formula grants, which are allocated, as the name implies, by formula to grant recipients. And those funds flow somewhat automatically from the federal government to state governments or to transit agencies or airports or other eligible recipients um, on a formula basis. Then there's the discretionary grants, which is the primary focus of our discussion today, which are the grant programs that you apply for and compete for from others in order to receive those funds. Um, often there's an application process involved. Oftentimes there's a benefit cost analysis involved. And uh, so we're going to help to clarify that, that entire process. Uh, a lot of these funds that we'll be talking about have been newly enacted by the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act or the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law, uh, that, which, is, which was just passed in, uh, and enacted on November 15th and, and is in effect for a five-year period, federal fiscal years 22 through 26. Um, a lot of these programs are, um, uh, are subject to annual appropriations as well. So in addition to this big authorization over a multi-year period. You've also got annual appropriations, which need to be passed in order to provide funding on any given year. The grants are available for a number of different transportation modes, as we'll talk about. Um, there, there is an emphasis on and, and dollars associated with highway programs, but there's a lot of funds for other purposes as well, and a lot of flexibility to flex those funds from highways to other purposes, as we'll talk about. So an overview of the bill in general is that it provides $513 billion in new funding for infrastructure purposes. And I want to point out that it wasn't just for transportation, but also for a number of other purposes as well. So energy, broadband, electric vehicle networks, uh, water, uh, environmental re remediation, resiliency, a lot of classes of infrastructure are eligible for funds under this program or under this, this, this bill in addition to transportation. And that's great news because, uh, you know, for all of you who, this is a transportation summit, but for all of you who are also thinking about your opportunities for other types of infrastructures in your community, there's a lot here. Now, there's 18 billion in discretionary funds, just in FY22 alone. And that's three to uh, four times as much discretionary funding as DOT has typically handed out in, a, in, in the past. So a significant increase in the funds available from these programs. And we're gonna talk about these opportunities in particular um, in a moment. So next six months are gonna be a pretty busy period with a lot of the, what they call notice of funding opportunities or NOFOs coming out for a lot of these programs. RAISE, which used to be TIGER, used to be the BUILD program and now is RAISE. We'll talk in a moment about what that stands for. But that program actually had its NOFO released last month and those grants are due on April 14th, those applications are due. But a lot of these other programs will be due over the next few weeks and months as these other NOFOs roll out. A lot of these are for programs that have existed already and that will have new funds. More, they have more money to work with, but they're existing programs. So they're the ones that are happening earlier in the cycle. There's also brand new programs like MEGA. And in Q1, they're going to be talking about what the program criteria are, but they're still in the process of establishing that program. There's also a lot of new programs on the environmental front and the, the, the energy front. Those programs will have a lot of their NOFOs come out later in the year because there's work involved by the federal government to get those teed up and ready to go. So let's talk about some of the updates to the major existing programs. Um, MEGA, as I noted, is a, is a new pot of funds that's available for major projects exceeding $100 million in cost, and also um, for projects that have uh, a major impact economically on a national basis. So they warrant a significant federal investment as a result. The funds are partitioned, so about half the funds will be available for projects between $100 and $500 million in cost. 
the other half will be for projects greater than $500 million in cost. So this is a, a great program for very large infrastructure projects, fitting the classes of infrastructure in the box at the bottom. Very wide applicability, but it has to be a relatively high cost project to qualify. Raise, on the other hand, um, I think is, is, is one for folks in this room in particular to have your eye on because it's local and regional project assistance. It's a little bit smaller program. It's aimed at smaller projects, provides a maximum grant of about $25 million, but they've got $1.5 billion to distribute this cycle um, in raise grant funds. Um, you see the, the selection criteria up here. So projects that meet those selection criteria in the middle of the slide will be the ones that will be most likely to be funded by the, by the feds. They've also got a new rating system in place. So they're looking to provide greater transparency into which projects are selected for grants, how they're selected and how they compare to other projects by widening the number of categories that they rate these projects on um, to, to, to qualify for grants. Just a little bit more about RAISE. As I noted, the, the, the NOFO is out. Um, there's a minimum grant amount of, a, of $1 million for rural areas, 5 million for urban areas. Um, and they'll have to partition the funds. Half of it will go to rural, half of it will go to urban areas of the country. Um, there's a chunk of funds available for planning and design as well. So if you've got a project that you're looking for planning or design funds, this could be a good program to look at to help to fund those needs. The rest of the funds, so 75 million out of 1.5 billion will go to planning and design. The rest will all go towards expenses that help to contribute to construction of actual projects. Um, and you do need a BCA for this program as you do for many of them. And we'll, we're gonna talk in a moment about what, what that involves. INFRA is another major program of note with uh, basically aimed at freight uh, and nationally significant freight projects. Um, so if, you, if it improves the safety, efficiency, reliability of the movement of goods and people, it's gonna qualify for an INFRA grant. Um, these are, this is one that states must apply for. So these tend to be managed by state DOTs and, and the projects are selected by and applied for by states. Um, so major funding pot for state sponsored projects. Last one I wanna highlight um, because I know, you know, port infrastructure is important for this part of the country is that Marad's Port Infrastructure Development Program is a long standing program um, which has it, more funds than it's had in the past. So they'll have 450 million a year over five years as an advance appropriation. There could be more to distribute for this and other programs if annual appropriations provide additional funds to any of these programs. Um, so you do have new eligibilities uh, under this program to support resiliency and address climate impacts and reduce emissions. So um, excellent opportunity for port infrastructure. So there are some significant new programs and in the interest of time, I'm not gonna go into these in detail, but we have a, 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 a policy brief that I'd be happy to email to anybody looking for more detail about any of these programs. But there are a number of new programs that are part of the bill that address very specific needs. So you can see there's funding for bridges, for culvert removal, charging infrastructure, um, uh, protect is a, is a um, uh, environmental sustainability and resiliency program. So there are some very specific new types of funds that could help some of your projects that maybe haven't qualified or competed well for some of the other pots in the past, worth knowing about. In addition, there are a number of other programs. Uh, many of these that are on this list have existed for a long time. Some of them are new, but FHWA, FTA, Office of Multimodal Freight Infrastructure Policy, also have funds that are targeted at specific purposes. Someone was mentioning earlier, there was interest, interest in bus and bus facilities grants. So there's a formula program and there's also a competitive program there for bus grants. Um, there's also emphasis of funding for low and no emissions vehicles. So look, those looking to green their fleets um, can qualify for funds there. Also the electric and low emitting ferry program. So um, for those looking to put ferry, projects in place that, that use lower emissions vehicles, there's a solution there um, with federal help. All right, so let's talk a little bit about the grant application uh, timing. So you have raise, we'll use raise as an example, since that's on the street right now, that's out there. 
And the, the NOFO was finalized on January 28th with a deadline of 8 p.m. Eastern on April 14th. Something to keep in mind with that is that it's always best to submit as early as possible. You never know what's gonna happen with those websites on the day of submittal. Um, and you do need to be registered with grants.gov, the federal government's grants portal. That can take up to three weeks. So you'll wanna have your ducks in a row to make sure you've got an active account to be able to submit on application day. There are a couple deadlines with a lot of these programs. Um, there's an obligation deadline and there's an expenditure deadline. And the obligation deadline is the point by which you need to have met all of your um, requirements and have your grant agreement in place to have your funds obligated by the federal government. Um, so what that means is you've got some lead time to help to meet the federal requirements for any grant. So if you have to, if you haven't cleared in your, your environmental clearance yet, um, completed the NEPA process prior to applying for the grant, there's some lead time to help to accomplish completion of those steps. And in this case, it's four years, September 30th, 2026, four and a half years, really. And then you have an additional five years to spend the money by. So the money all has to be spent for this round by September 30th, 2031. Um, that's different. Some people will recall if you were in this space 10, 12 years ago with the original rounds of Tiger, you had to spend that money really fast. It had to be obligated and expended within two or three years. And that's because the policy objective at that point was to spend the money as fast as possible to help to stimulate the economy. What's happening with these funds now is the emphasis is really more on the quality of the project rather than spending the money quickly. So they're being more deliberate about which projects get chosen. And they're also trying to make sure that you have enough lead time to deliver these projects. So it's, it's not as much about spending it as fast as possible, but spending it on the right projects these days. And there's a lot of runway for that. So benefits and challenges of federal grants, some things to keep in mind is that, well, it provides additional funding, that's good. And you don't have to pay it back if it's a grant that can help to fill a project funding gap, or it can, you know, if you have a project that is funded, it can potentially help to fund that project so you can take other funds that maybe are, are, are local or state funds and shift them over to another project. So getting funds for this project can help make room to, to, to fund a different project. But what are the challenges associated with that? First of all, it federalizes the project. So what that means is that all of the strings attached to applying for federal funds come into play. So you will have to have uh, NEPA clearance, uh, which is you know National Environmental Policy Act. You'll have to have an environmental impact statement or uh, a, an environmental assessment or um, uh, and uh, categorical exclusion from NEPA, depending on the nature of the environmental impacts of the project. So you got to study that and 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 meet that requirement. Um, there will also be requirements regarding Buy America or. Um, Davis-Bacon labor requirements that go with federal money. So there are strings and they can add cost and time to the project. And it's important to weigh the impacts of that against the benefit of the additional funds that the federal money provides. Um, th then once you have a grant, you have to meet the reporting requirements. They also have oversight of your project. So you, you, you know, you're going to have somebody looking over you to make sure you're getting your project done correctly. And that can be a good thing, but it can also, you know, it's like, 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 you know, when we're minding our children to make sure they finish their meal, it's, um, you know, can, can be an irritant as well. So you, you've got to be mindful of the, the, the good and the bad with, with, with those um, steps involved. Um, and then you've got to meet it. you got to meet your project delivery deadline as well. Um, so a lot, a lot to weigh in considering which approach makes sense. But obviously, a lot of agencies out there, you know, stand to benefit from the money because without the money, you're you're talking about projects that might not happen, and that's why this is so important to um, uh, you know have this opportunity to apply for funds because the the strings can be managed um, and and will can help to make infrastructure possible that wouldn't otherwise be able to be funded. Okay, we're going to shift gears for a second. We've got another question here for everybody. So same poll as before, if you have the web browser open with the earlier poll, you can do that, or 
you can go to Menti and the code is again right on the top of the slide if you want to go there. Question for everyone this time is which local projects, you know, projects that you are thinking of in your communities might be good candidates for these grants. If anybody has any um, that they want to put up, they'll start to populate on the screen here in a second. New ferries. Excellent. And there's targeted funds for ferries in the program, so that's good. Barge Landing, Klondike Highway. Um, both, of, both of those are um, opportunities for funding here. We're seeing um, Wood Bay Hub, have harbor dredging, um, with roads, port infrastructure. Um, so um, some, some great ideas here and some great opportunities here for infrastructure investment. And we'll talk a little bit about how we can help to, you know, pull funds, bring funds home to help to pay for that infrastructure. So um, we're going to talk about some grant applications best practices here. Okay. So when you're thinking about applying for a federal grant, these are some pitfalls to avoid. And these are based on our experience with the types of feedback the USDOT has provided to grant applicants. One of the things that we like to do is when we've worked with someone to a, a prepare a grant application, we'll do a debrief and we'll go into USDOT with them and uh, we'll talk about, you know, what you like about our application or what, what you didn't like. And some things that we've heard over the years from that feedback for projects that weren't funded was, you know, if you're trying to create something that isn't really there, you know, they'll see through that. You've got to have a real project that, that they can know and understand. Um, you've got to make the case for what you're doing and put that supporting data in the benefit cost analysis instead of putting it up front. At the end of the day, they're making judgments based on the hard data that you put into that BCA, and they want that incorporated there. So knowing um, how your benefits are quantified and incorporated into the BCA is going to be far more persuasive than just sort of talking generalities in a qualitative way that doesn't contribute to the BCA score. Um, and then having a format that really helps to draw out the key points. You know, think about yourself. If, if you would rather read something that is just, you know, plain text without headers or think about your favorite magazine or website, think about how it might use headers or pictures or graphics or other tools to emphasize the key points. It's the same thing with people who are reviewing grants. You really want to make the key points pop out at them so that they don't miss the gems associated with your project in reviewing your application. So other, other, other things that we've heard, this is some federal advice. So the Biden administration just put out a new fact sheets, five or six page document that highlights the grant opportunities for local governments that are coming out in the near future. And these are a few things that they've highlighted in that. Um, you know, you wanna make sure your project is in your tip uh, because they, they're looking to fund projects that are moving along through the plans and not, not ones that are materializing on a thin air here. Um, they advise too that, um, you know, you can, you can do legwork to put it into your capital planning. So if you've got, as you're planning your capital improvement plan for your agency, you can start to think about what your needs are and develop a pipeline of which projects might be coming to, to really get your ducks in a row um, and think ahead about, about your capital plans. Um, there's a lot of funds for things like electric vehicle and alternative fuel charging stations. So they suggest starting to map that. Where would you like those facilities to be in your com community? Um, or if you have lead pipes, you know, knowing where that infrastructure is, um, you know, just some basic mapping to sort of have the needs mapped prior to the grants opening up will be helpful to, to pulling the money um, home. And then establishing relationship with federal agency regional offices. This is an important one, and we've, we've had some representatives of federal agencies here the last couple of days. They can be partners for you in um, understanding your projects and talking with you about um, what your needs are and how they can help. And they're really willing and able to listen. That's, that's their job to meet with you and provide that technical assistance. So would really strongly encourage that outreach to the feds um, to, 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 to engage them in your project. 
So some tips and tricks for grant success. You need, you know, we talked about the clarity of your presentation is important. So make it clear what your needs are and what the impacts of the project will be. Um, make it, make sure it's a good presentation that it, that it uses maps and other graphics to be easy to read. Um, you wanna make sure if you're doing a BCA, benefit cost analysis, make sure it aligns with the federal expectations because they do update their guidance from time to time on what they wanna see in a BCA. And they're gonna to wanna to make sure that you're, you're, you're using, you're doing the correct methodology in your analysis. Um, you know, another point you've had, you've heard from your congressional delegation um, the last few days and having them on board for your project can be really important because they will, they, to some extent, the folks in Washington who are making decisions about which projects to fund will be looking to the support from the congressional delegation to know which direction to head. And coordination is important too, um, because one thing the feds don't want to do is they don't want to be the referee between compete, multiple competing proposals from the same region or the same state for the same pot of funds. So the extent to which you can start to, uh, you know, coordinate regionally and locally on what you're going after to make sure you're not sort of creating competing proposals amongst yourselves helps to sort of winnow the field a bit to make it a little easier for the feds to, to, to make a decision. Um, you know, just a few other best practices is to think about how you can brand your project. So, you know, some buzzwords that have been used in past projects, gateway, multimodal, or connector, so kind of a term that helps describe visually what your project does can be really important to helping the feds understand what it is, if, if, if it would be unclear to them about what it is. Talked about meeting with USDOT. Um, you want to make sure that your project fits you know, read the NOFO, understand what's in there in terms of what, what, what's eligible and make sure your project lines up with it to make and make sure your submittal is compliant. Um, you, you don't want to miss anything obvious because, again, that becomes an easy decision on which project not to fund if the application was incomplete. Um, all right. Talk a little bit about our grants experience. We have helped a lot of projects over the years with grant applications. Um, out of 14.5 billion in USDOT grants awarded over the last few years, um, we've supported 2.3 billion of those. And in Alaska alone, we've helped support applications for $101 million for 19 grant applications. Um, so as a firm, we've got a lot of experience with helping to support grant applications that have been successful in achieving grants for our, our clients. Other ways we can assist when it comes to funding and financing, thinking about the ladder of services, you know, it's not just about the application, but also about identifying which project should pursue the grants and having, uh, you know, if a project has a funding gap, developing a strategic funding approach for that to say, here are ways that we could fill that gap is something that we look at. And then looking at you know, if a project has a gap, what are the grant opportunities? What are other funding opportunities to help fill that grant gap? Can financing be involved where you're borrowing funds to help pay for a project or cover the cost of a project in the near term and pay it back over time? Um, but we've got tools to do financial analysis and, and to examine and, and, and provide solutions to address funding gaps. Um, a lot of times that will culminate in the grant application and the BCA that gets submitted. Um, and then if, if there's an award, um, we can help with grants management too, uh, to, to, to help to, to, to manage the grant. So something that you can be mindful of now with grants is that there's not enough time to do everything after the NOFO drops. So right now, for example, that NOFO for the raise grant is out on the street. And so the clock's ticking towards April 14th. We've got about two months before the grant deadline at this point. Um, and there's a lot to pull together so there may be things that, you, you know, I, th I think this is where agencies have to make a, uh, a decision sometimes about whether to go or no go on a grant application. And sometimes it's better to wait for the next cycle and get your ducks in a row and have a higher quality application ready for next time, rather than to jump out and get put, put some, you know, proposal out that has a very low likelihood of getting funded. I mean, if you have doubts about how good of a, 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 a an application might be um, and, and 
concerns about how competitive it might be and until you do certain other things it, the feds are probably going to sense that as well and 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 you know taking the time to sort of refine the design figure out other elements of that project with more clarity figure out how you'd cover any funding gap with it before you apply for the federal funds can be helpful to make it more competitive so sometimes waiting works and there are things you can do while you're waiting for the nofo under that prior to nofo column and then during the nofo response time once the nofo drops the things that you want to be doing are the actual application at that point. So gathering letters of support, that's a really important part of these applications um, is all the letters of support from all the, you know, state and local officials, federal officials who are willing to support your project. Um, writing a narrative uh, and the BCA, which is the, the, the key elements of the application itself and then graphic design. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the benefit cost analysis in detail. So the BCA, very simply, you've got the benefits of your project and you've got the cost. And the cost is pretty much, you, you know what your capital cost is and you know what it's gonna to cost to maintain your project. So that's kind of known on the one hand. The benefits are quantification of actual costs that you would incur for your project and might involve things like savings. Uh, here's fuel, vehicle O&M costs, freight logistics, pavement maintenance. Those are actual costs or sorry, actual savings that may result from your from your project and, and would be funds you don't have to expend as a result of the project existing. And then there's the societal costs and those have a monetary value, a theoretical monetary value, but maybe don't have a, a specific cost associated with them or, 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 or dollar value, um, except in a theoretical way. So that's things like improved air quality. Um, there are federal formulas and approaches for evaluating reductions in certain, you know, um, regulated uh, air uh, emission, regulated emissions or greenhouse gases, and you can use those formulas to estimate what the societal impact is on the uh, air quality and, and use that in a, in a quantitative way in the BCA. A lot of this stuff will require some homework to figure out, you know, what is the emissions reduction? What is the time savings, the travel time savings, or crash reduction, or health benefits? You know, there's all these factors that can affect your project, and you need a little bit of data to help to underpin these calculations. You run it through the model, the BCA model, and, and it will create, you know, the benefits. It'll compare it to the costs. There's a little bit of a discounting calculation applied to make sure the dollars are are in the same uh, same year dollars, and that'll give you um, what that what that benefit cost uh, number ratio is. Ultimately, you want your BCA to be higher than one. That means that the benefits are higher than the costs, but the higher can be above one, the better. Um, that's going to be perceived as more more competitive for funds because it, it has a greater return of, of benefits to costs. In a lot of cases, the feds are saying, we're not interested in projects with a BCA of less than one, unless it somehow contains some sort of benefits to the community or underserved populations or others that can't be easily quantified. And I think that there'll, there'll probably be a very special circumstance where they would take that into account, but they, they do um, really do wanna see projects with a BCA greater than one if possible. So uh, uh, with the BCA that you you have economists who are using USDOT approaches for doing this, they, they, that, that they are using the, the guidance that the federal government publishes um, and those parameters are updated to, to current year dollars. Um, there's also, the BCA is, is a report, usually it's, it's a brief report, you know, 12 to 20 pages that summarizes what the, the, the the ratio is, but there's a number of technical appendices that go with it. Because if your project is competitive for funds, the feds are gonna drill in and make sure that, you know, you haven't missed anything in doing your BCA to make sure that it's a fair assessment of your project's benefits. And so these technical appendices lay out these assumptions and um, some of the details uh, of, your, of your analysis. Um, they are customized analyses. They're not black boxes. It's not like you can just take certain figures and put them in. There, there is some, some real methodology that goes into this using the data that's specific to your project to, to make it happen. 
Um, we talked a moment ago about some types of be project benefits, but here are others that you can see up here. And the key point on this slide is that you've got to be able to quantify those benefits. You've got to have some sense of what these numbers are, because if the economists don't have any sense of what the ridership will be or what the emissions reduction might be, um, they won't have the data they need to run the analysis. And usually the, 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 the economists can help to provide ways of estimating that, but you need some seed values like ridership, for example, or traffic. Those numbers can help to provide a starting point for quantifying these benefits in the, um, in the analysis. There are a number of roles to be aware of in the grant preparation process. So I wanna point out that people are familiar with grant writers who write the grant itself often, and they're important. That's an important part. The narrative helps to make a persuasive case for your project, but oftentimes there'll be others who contribute to that that are important people to have in the process as well. So technical editors or graphic designers, political liaisons who can help to evaluate your grant application. In some cases, you might need some technical assistance with preparing elements of your application, especially if, you know, going back a slide, if you need someone who can provide ridership or other estimates to get some of the project benefit data squared away. Um, those would be other sorts of, of individuals who'd be involved in the process. And the BCA itself is usually performed by economists, um, people who are trained in economics and professionally perform uh, these types of analyses. So that, that, that's a very specific role to the process. All right, I'm gonna turn it over to Chris at this point. So that was about 30 minutes of benefit cost analysis, grant writing, and I'm sure you're all ready to run right out and do your grant applications and secure all this funding for your communities. I'm Chris Latuso, I'm the Advisory Services Director for our Transportation Business Group for HDR. I wanna take a minute to explain what advisory services is, and, and it's pretty simple. We listen to the challenges that our clients are faced with, and we assemble services to help solve those challenges. So. What Nate was just talking about, grant writing, benefit cost analyses, those are services that we provide in our advisory services group. So what are we hearing from states across the United States when we ask them, hey, what are some of the challenges you're faced with? Well, there's a very consistent theme of a lack of staff. State agencies, government agencies, local communities, there's a re reduction in funding, there's attrition through retirements. There isn't that backlog of experienced people coming in and taking over the roles that are being vacated by people who really had decades of experience. And, and one of the phrases we, we use often is, the 30 year experienced individual is getting replaced with a 30 year old. And it, there's a lot of truth to that. So we help our clients fill that gap of experience and knowledge and, and really just people. Another consistent thing we're hearing is we wanna make sure we're securing funding from all of this money that's coming from the federal government that we could give back to our communities and how do we do that? I'm here to tell you, you're not late, you're not alone. There's a lot of need and it's very consistent and, and we're here to help, right? We, this is what we do. There are people out there that are ready to help you with all that. So uh, the important part of all of this grant application is, yes, it's very important, but it's just the first step in the project and program life cycle, right? So sure, you, you get your money in place, you do your capital planning, you figure out what you're gonna do, but now there's the design component, the construction component, I have startup and commissioning. Nate talked a bit about the electric vehicle conversions. There's charging stations, there's a commission component to things like that. There's the operations and maintenance. These are all aspects of a programmatic approach that think about the 30% increase in funding. I'm sure you're all busy with your day jobs today. Now you're gonna put 30% on top of that in addition to all of the need to, to do the actual grant application. So what's the, what's the key component here? Well, startup is really critical. And if you look at that graph on the right, as time goes on, the ability to influence 
Success in a program decreases as time goes on, and the costs required to affect change as time goes on increases. So get your client program and an integrated team, make your key decisions. These are all important steps. The earlier, the better. There's also a lot of tools that are available to all of you to help make this process better, to monitor the progress of your programs, identify trends and make corrective action if necessary, keep your projects and programs on schedule and budget, help make decisions. And, and Nate talked a bit about the reporting needs and the transparency that the federal government's gonna require in to use the funding and make sure you get reimbursement. You have to meet all these criteria. So. Back to uh, back to Menti. So you're with now, this, oh, oh, you're, oh no, sorry. I was just want to say you're you're now like I don't know forty minutes experienced in all of this process, and let's let's get a let's get a real gauge on where you are. So back to Menti, and I think you just slide it right. Or, yeah. So so go ahead and do a little mental workshop here for yourself, for you and your organization. How is this feeling for you? Like, where are you with, with some of the things that you need to be thinking about to be prepared for grants? And if you go back to menti.com, you move the sliders on these questions and they'll kind of aggregate and show up over here. Is that question showing up for you? menti.com and the code is 7001. Four six six three. Yeah, there you go. Everyone's got it all figured out. You know, I think it, it, that's very telling. I've decided which grants fit my projects. Well, now it seems to be, as I started to say how far to the right it was, it started to drift back to the left. But that's an important step. There's a lot of different types of funding of options and availability. I can't see the, uh, the engineering. Oh, there you go. I think that's pretty good. That's more prepared than I would have expected. We've been at it a long, long time. Good. Yeah. <laughs> it's that 40 minutes. <laughs> so we're a little over on time. But Robert, do you want us to do a quick Q&A or? Yeah. Uh, yes. Yep. Okay, great. So um, go right ahead. You want me to do it? <laughs> Sign language isn't working. <laughs> All right, I did have a. Oh, you want me to move? That's okay. That's okay. Still, yeah. So somebody, somebody. these are these are very exciting times for Alaska, and you know, thinking about the influx of funding via grants, um, you know, can can be overwhelming sometimes. But uh, you know, there are these opportunities, and I just want to give you the chance to pick these guys' brains and ask any questions you have here about um, how to access grant funding, grant preparedness, those of the streams that are out there. What kind of questions do we have here? So do you do collaborative effort grants with multiple municipalities? And what is your fee structure? Um, well, the, yes, we, we do. We support all types of grants uh, applications. And, and I think that that you know, combining forces across multiple communities can be a way to strengthen an application because instead of having you know a smaller array of projects that are competing against each other, you're you're, you're joining up and you're providing value to the feds by um, strengthening uh, that approach together. You know, the the, uh, the 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 fee structure question. I'm going to turn to Chris on that one. Um, and uh, uh, I'm going to say it's it's pretty tailored for the needs of whoever we're working with. So, if you have grant writers on your own staff, if you have economists that can do the, the benefit cost analyses, we work with we work across the spectrum. As I said earlier, to fill the gaps, we're, we're here to support clients, not take over, but support through all of our local offices and and fill in whatever gaps that our clients have. Question yeah. for uh, yes, I'm John Erickson. I'm from beautiful downtown Yakutat. Um, my question is simply this. Uh, 
we had Tiger, uh, we had Build, then we have, now we have Raise. And um, I applied for those and they awarded one per, in Alaska for Anchorage, you know, and that's not, a, that's not a rural area, but apparently that must be. Um, and they wanted, they built a bridge in Nana, I think. And that's it after about four or five years. And that's all the tiger did. And so I'm looking at Ray's, I'm saying, is this really worth my time? Um, Cause it's a big application. Now I have, a, I can copy it from other years, but I, I guess that's my, my question is, it's very, very competitive. And I, I don't mean to say that. Also, you look like Tom Cruise. <laughs> 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 And um, you know, as you answer this, maybe we'll ask Haynes. You know, if it's if it's worth uh, worth applying for, how many times did you have to apply before you got? To... I go six before we got it. Yeah, it it isn't necessarily um, something that that people get the grant on the first try. I think what we found works for clients who are looking to improve their odds in the next cycle is to go and get a debrief with the federal government, find out what, what did they like? What did they not like about your application? What do they think you could do differently to help make the case for them? And based on that advice, we've seen projects that have been redefined. Maybe they drop an element that the feds didn't think was part of what made it very competitive, or sometimes they've added elements. You can combine projects together um, to, to, to provide elements. Um, there are ways of sort of including or excluding certain scope elements of the project in order to hit at what the benefits will be in the BCA so that you can cinch the, the, the BCA upward. But that advice from the feds, I think, in, in taking a clear-eyed look at what the project did well and what it could do better is what can really help to make it more competitive for the program. The good news about the current environment is that there is a lot more money to go around. So it's likely that projects that might not have made the cut before could make it now because you've got a lower bar to, to meet. Um, that's part of the reason why they put more money into these programs because there was so much demand and so many great projects out there, but so little money to go around. So now there's more money for it. Hopefully we can over the course of five years and hopefully into the future as well, start to address the needs of a lot of these projects. Okay. Couple of questions on this side of the room. Yeah, in my, in my experience uh, helping clients write uh, grant applications, it seems uh, very um, easy to get a congressional delegation letter of support, but uh, do you have any advice or um, um, lessons learned on getting from what is really an endorsement of the project to true advocacy and support from your congressional delegation. So there are lots of key things that are, are good political statements. Equity is a big driver. Reduction in carbon emissions is a big driver. If you can get your your, your Congress on congressman on board with those types of programs and show that it does have true public benefit in addition to just completing a project. I think that's a component that is often overlooked as, as valuable. Yeah, I would agree with that. I think that if you can help them understand how the project aligns with, you know, their own worldview of the types of things that they want to support, um, it, it can help, you know. So Senator Murkowski, for example, had a big role in shaping this bill as it moved through the Senate. And there were certain objectives that she was looking for in that. And if you can help convince her office of what it is that makes your project particularly well suited to align with some of what she was after, I, I think that, that that sort of tailored advocacy can help. Hi, I'm Melissa from Sitka. Thanks for being here today. If I have a, a BCA from July of 2021, is that gonna be fine or does it have to be updated for this next round? You would probably need to update some of the coefficients in that BCA to reflect whatever the current dollar values are that are being applied. But if the rest of the data is relatively current, it, it's probably just more of arithmetic exercise than something that would have to be completely reanalyzed. 
Okay, thanks. And then um, as far as the debriefs go from the last raise grants, uh, have you heard of anybody getting one? Do you know what that looks like? I've put in an email, but I'm not hearing anything back. And they say it's going to take eight to 12 weeks. And I don't really have time for that if it's due <laughs> April. Yeah, well, then that, that can happen that they get backed up. Um, I would I would stay on it and try to try to try to keep on them to, to try to get it. They do meet with people and but they do get busy with it. So the earlier that you can request the debrief, the better. So some advice to everybody is the day you find out that you did not get your grant, make your request for your debrief at that point so that you're early in the queue and can get it right away. Don't, don't wait until you're trying to figure out if you're going to apply for it next time or not. Because even if you decide, well, we weren't successful and I'm not sure I want to go for a raise or whatever grant again in the future, you'll still learn things about it that could be helpful to other processes, perhaps for state processes or perhaps for a different federal grant. So the debrief is always really valuable um, to understand how your project was perceived by the federal government. But I would, I would just, in your case, just keep on them, keep, keep, uh, checking in to see, you know, has anything changed? Um, and if you've got a phone number for anybody, I don't know if you're dealing with folks in Washington or regionally, but you know, <laughs> try both. You know, if you're if you're if you're not getting anywhere with the region, try contacting the folks in Washington who are managing the program, or vice versa. Is there any value in getting, um, uh, even if you got approved, to getting that uh, debrief uh, to understand why you scored so high, so you can use those same rationales on your next round. Yeah, absolutely. You can learn a lot from, from that. So that's a great, great idea as well. I'll share with you that is exactly the process we take in running our business, right? When we work with all of states, locals, and we submit proposals, the second we find out we didn't win, we want to know why. And it's, it's, a, it's a very similar process. There's, there's no short, shortage of information and all information is valuable. Other questions, communities with challenging projects, otherwise Thrustmaster of Texas will come up with a good question because she's trying to get things done in Thrustmaster of Alaska land. What is your percentage of win? Um, so our percentage of wins is, um, I'm going back to the slide that had that graph on it. Um, yeah, it, it's, uh, uh, it's like three quarters of the pie. So let's say 75%. Well, that, that, <laughs> just <laughs> you, got the, you got your wedges reversed there. <laughs> no, it's, it's, it's about 16% um, of the total funds available that we've supported applications for. So the feds have, have distributed 14.5 billion in grants and, uh, and, and we've supported about 2.3 billion of those. Um, and, and you can see too, so we've supported around 200 grants and about uh, a, that 96 is now up to 100 with some that were just recently announced. So it's about half the grants that we've supported have been successful grant recipients. Well, we, we do a lot, as an organization, we support transportation, but we also have water, wastewater, environmental, we have other business groups that support other infrastructure markets. Um, and we're increasingly supporting grants for those purposes as well. We have a, a, a water grants team, um, for example, who does a lot of this on the water side. And uh, as these new programs are rolled out that are providing additional funds for infrastructure categories that didn't have competitive programs anymore, you know, we're, we're growing our practice to uh, provide support for those areas as well. And we've got a robust energy section too, because um, make sure there's a lot of work here in the region for mm -hmm. energy development. Okay, last chance at uh, some deep resources. Uh, we'll have this slide deck on our website for, for folks as well. It's great information. I really appreciate uh, y'all making the effort to come here and provide it to us, explain it to us, and tell us again during the break that's coming up next as well. So any closing thoughts or comments or 
Well, just thank you again. And to say this, this process and these funds are accessible and, you know, manageable and that grant preparedness piece, you know, don't wait until the NOFO, you know, be doing your work ahead of time. Um, our contact information is there if you want to ping us with questions. And then on the back table is um, a quick little handout about some of the ways that we support with grants and it's a very exciting time. Yeah, go for it. Thank you very All right. much. Thank you. Yeah, well, that's why we're here, right? I put it like in what? this morning. What? What? Oh, I can, I, I, you got it, I'm good. Look, uh, to everybody, first of all, I wanted to stop and give you a round of applause for enduring to the end of three days. I've also learned a long time ago that your brain can never absorb more than your butt is willing to endure. So uh, I hope that you, again, thank you for staying out and listening. And when I was talking to Robert, um, you know, we really are trying to help make sure that you are aware of these programs exist. And so that's why you know, we made, we put this panel together. We know that, uh, this is not the first, and hopefully Robert will be doing more training as things are available so that you'll be aware of these programs and we can work with Robert on make, about making sure that you and your communities get the right messaging out. So basically how this session is going to work is Travis Black, Tim Pickering, and uh, Danny are going to uh, give discussions uh, with PowerPoints on their presentations. Then after that, we'll have Linda speak about federal transit. We'll have the Coast Guard talk about how they bring the entire maritime domain kind of together. And then we're gonna have Carl with Porter Gino talk about his experience in grants and things of that nature. So the idea is coming through what's the programs, how they look, and yet you know, what's the big, big maritime space and then how the grants work. So, and then after that, we have another session, another speaker after that. So really, uh, these people are all resources. They are all advocates. Um, with the exception of Carl, they're all your federal tax dollars at work. Don't hold that against them. But again, they're all here because they believe it's important to improve, you know, the, the transportation uh, community and support that either through advocacy, regulatory, whatever is education in the region. So having said that, Travis, I'm going to turn it over to you first. Your security risk. <laughs> with with uh, with six panelists, we decided to keep our slides down to thirty seven. So we're going to go really quick. <laughs> I wish I was kidding, but uh, anyway, <laughs> this is uh, this kind of we want to talk a little bit about what is the what is our supports on waterways. Talk about the Marine Highway Program, some of the other grant opportunities. Uh, we've got some resources, uh, Port Planning Investment Toolkit, and uh, we'll have questions probably at the very end, but. Um, we're a non-regulatory agency, meaning uh, we're here to support the uh, maritime industry, strengthen the transportation system, and uh, meet the needs, needs, national security needs of the country. Our office is the Ports and Waterways, and uh, these are our priorities. Um, just uh, trying to make sure that uh, we, we're successful when uh, ports and communities are, are moving freight on the water and that they're doing it uh, with with extra resources, extra money. So these are a few of the uh, funding programs uh, that uh, that the um, Bipartisan Infrastructure Law or, or by IIJA uh, that, that uh, I'm gonna talk about here in a little bit, but uh, these are some of the big uh, programs that, uh, that were really funded at a very high level uh, in the law that was passed in November. Uh, just uh, your PIDP, the infra, there's some new things. These are all across USDOT. Um, and I think you heard about some of these from HDR, but uh, just uh, the, the enormous amount of resources that have been uh, dedicated. So these are the four major programs that we're involved in. Uh, we regularly review the applications for these grants. 
and I'll have some slides in a little bit. But first, I'm going to turn it over to uh, to Tim, and he's going to talk about the Marine Highway Program. Okay. Okay. Um, it's not on. It's not on. Just on the top. Oh, okay. There we go. Uh, so I, I wanted to just run quickly through a couple of slides to uh, give you some background on our program. And uh, it's relatively small compared to the other uh, large infrastructure programs, but it has some very unique features about it, which which make it a, a good fit uh, in, the, uh, in the, the space that we're trying to fit in. So the program was established uh, 15 years ago, from actually, <laughs> Uh, 2007 by the Clean Energy Act. Uh, originally, it just said that the secretary would uh, 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 designate uh, marine highway routes uh, on navigable waters around the United States, and um, that uh, it would uh, designate projects on that, on those routes, in order to relieve uh, landside congestion. So uh, it was subsequently uh, amended. They expanded the, the scope of the, so that it, it uh, includes public benefits. So we, now we look at things uh, like um, reduced road damage, uh, reduced uh, emissions, uh, reduced congestion, those sorts of things. Um, and um, then it was, uh, this was one of the more important ones. They initially we could only handle roll on and containerized cargoes. So they added uh, the, um, uh, palletized unitized cargoes uh, and for some reason other freight vehicles on commuter passenger ferries so <laughs> um, so that was the uh, the only thing we really cannot support at this point is pure bulk uh, there's been some discussions about trying to change that so we could support some agriculture uh, but um, you know I'm sure it would exclude uh, energy because or coal you know because that's one of the things that the, the administration is trying to uh, uh, they said well there's actually a uh, executive order not to subsidize uh, any sorts of, uh, of fossil fuels at the moment. Uh, and then lastly was just an administrative change. The, the program had been called the Short Sea Shipping Program for 25 years, and they changed it to uh, uh, Marine Highway uh, Transportation. So this is the Marine Highway system as it exists right now. There's uh, 28 designated Marine Highways. Uh, they are numbered in accordance roughly with the interstate system that they parallel. So the Ohio River is the M70, the uh, East Coast is the M95, uh, the M5 runs down the uh, West Coast, the M55 is the Mississippi, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, right now we've designated all, but uh, in, at least in the inside the, uh, the continental United States, I think there's like three rivers in Pennsylvania and West Virginia that we have not, uh, because they only carry coal so far. So it, as they develop, uh, some other type of industries, uh, then uh, they would likely be, uh, the states would try to bring those into the system. Okay, next. So this is a little bit of a fuzzy blow up, but this is, uh, we took the, just focused in on that corner. So this is Alaska. You guys are covered by the M5 Alaska, which runs from the Washington State Canadian border up to the Aleutians, and then the MA1, which is uh, Cook Inlet. Uh, and it includes all the bays, uh, navigation channels, rivers, anything that feeds tributaries. If it's navigable and it feeds along that, then it's eligible to be part of the Marine Highway Program. Uh, we met uh, on Tuesday with the uh, acting uh, commissioner, DOT, and explained to him uh, most of this. And uh, we're trying to uh, work with the state to bring the pretty much the rest of the coast into the program. So uh, the original Marine Highway pro, uh, uh, route up here was uh, uh, sponsored by the uh, uh, Northwest Development Corporation, which is no longer exists. So we're gonna see if the state can take over ownership of that. There's no financial obligations, it's just a name thing only. And, um, and then expand it to make uh, the rest of the state eligible to, uh, to be part of the program. So uh, we used to put it where it's, it's in red, so it's the vast majority. We used to have a number, we used to say 29,000 miles. Uh, that was the number that was there when I, when I first arrived um, and no one could ever figure out where that number came from. So uh, we, <laughs> we, stopped, we stopped saying that. Uh, so we just said that, yeah, the vast majority of the navigable waters, uh, the Great Lakes the, uh, and the inland waterways and such are, are all designated, um, working on those last few, as I had mentioned. Um, and the Marine Highway Program has three steps. First, you have to be, uh, you designate the Marine Highway routes. 
And as I said, we got 28 routes covering 41 states, uh, the District of Columbia, five U.S. territories. So it's uh, it's pretty pretty wide reaching. Um, then once you're if if you are on one of those routes, you can apply for a a project designation. I'm trying to get the name changed to service because project means different things to different people. When the legislation says Marine Highway Project, it's referring to a Marine Highway Service. So we work with public-private partnerships to uh, try to set up um, uh, services to move freight from road and rail primarily. Uh, and um, that they submit a, a package to us that we have a there's a federal register notice that will list three times a year, uh, the end of January, the end of uh, May, and the end of September, when we will be accepting applications. Uh, they're vetted up through the secretary, it goes through an intermodal review process. It's looked at by federal highway, federal rail. Um, and um, <clears throat> the uh, uh, it, it's sent up to the secretary and if he signs off on it, then uh, they become one of those handful of designated projects. Right now we have the third step, which is, uh, makes you eligible for grants. So we have 52 designated projects at the moment. Um, and of those, perhaps 30 to 35 of them are actually either in development or, act or actively running. Uh, some of them have just, they, they were conceptual services that either uh, fell apart for, you know, lost, they, they lost their sponsor or capital or something. And so the, the business case changed. Uh, we're trying to call that hurt a little bit. So we're going to uh, hope over the next year or two, there's a, uh, a methodology in our in our final rule that allows us to uh, to get rid of the the deadwood, so to speak. Uh, but what that does is those are the only people that can apply for grants. So while we have a relatively small grant program, and I'll just give you as like we had fifty, we've awarded fifty one point seven million dollars to date, and that goes back to twenty ten. Uh, for five years, we didn't get any funding, so it was two thousand ten that was funded, and then sixteen on, we've been funded every year. And the numbers have been going up. It started out relatively small, $5 million. Uh, last year was $10.0. Uh, and I think it's they authorized $11 million this year. But uh, the um, uh, the infrastructure law had $25 million in it. So this year, we're, we're probably going to go from $51 million to $87 million in funding in one year. So $36 million this year will go out uh, under two different notices of funding. Um, the, uh, because there's such a small uh, pool of applicants, instead of getting the, you know, literally hundreds of applications that they get for the larger infrastructure programs, we typically have gotten 10 to 15. And uh, as a result of that small number, we've been able to, uh, uh, and because they're pre-vetted so that we know these are, are good projects, uh, we have um, have a success rate of about 78% in awarding either all or partial funding. Now, the, the way the legislation's written, it said we can fund the development and expansion of port and landside infrastructure, which is a really broad, you know, that covers buildings to, to uh, forklifts. And uh, it also says uh, the development and expansion of documented vessels. Uh, since the program uh, is currently not funded at a level to build ships or, or buildings, uh, we've stayed away from concrete and uh, we've been, primarily working with equipment. So we've had everything from improved port lighting so they could work, you know, at a third shift. Uh, we've had, um, we've built uh, barges. Uh, the largest grant we gave was $3.2 million to Tidewater Marine. Uh, and they were able to build a barge. Um, we've been, uh, we bought a lot of uh, forklifts and, and other cargo handling equipment, the uh, reed stackers, things like that. Um, so the, uh, what else will I go through there? Uh, all right, so let's go to this next. Yeah, there we go. So this is this is where the money goes, um, where we spend it primarily. And you see, it's about uh, the numbers. I think these are current. Forty-two percent have been spent on on vessels, either building, uh, buying, or modifying. Uh, and on the land side equipment, fifty-two percent. Uh, we've had. Uh, where it says water, that's pretty much been dredging alongside piers or, or creating turning basins, working outside of the, of the federal navigation channels. And 3% uh, has gone to, to planning grants. So we cannot fund uh, things like a market study to see if, you know, because you have to prove a market to get the designation. So you can't then have the designation and come back and ask for a market study. Uh, but you can uh, ask for um, 
a uh, we've developed developed a master plan for uh, the Cape May, uh, Delaware to Lewis, uh, New, um, or Cape May, New Jersey to, to Lewis, Delaware uh, ferry, uh, because they're going to develop uh, the next generation uh, all electric um, uh, ferries, and so we, we've we've funded the master plan for that. Uh, we funded um, uh, some engineering work uh, for the uh, uh, Mars, which is the Mid Atlantic Regional Spaceport, uh, because they're currently shipping. 200 foot rocket boosters down roads. And we're gonna put those on barges and they need a pier built at the launch facility. So those are the sorts of things that we've, we've been working on. We've also worked with the Washington State Ferries to uh, re-engine uh, one of their uh, Bainbridge to Seattle ferries uh, from uh, diesel to uh, electric. So <clears throat> we've got a, a pretty wide uh, uh, span of things we can fund. Now, the other thing that makes us unique is who can apply. So not only do we have the, uh, the, the applicants, you know, who got the, desi the designation, the project designation, but they can allow their private partners to fund, to, to apply directly for funds. And that's been a huge change for us. We, we made that change three years ago and probably three quarters of our grants now go to private entities instead of ports uh, or, or cities. And uh, so they're able to take that money and put it to work uh, that much faster since it doesn't have to filter through yet another level of bureaucracy. So um, I think that's, uh, yeah, here we go. So this, is, this just gives you some examples of the amounts of money that we've awarded for uh, 19 and 20. Uh, there was a recent award in 21, we awarded uh, nine. We had 10 eligible projects and we awarded nine of them, so 90% last year. Okay. And that's all I have. If anybody has any questions, I'll be around um, after this is over. So uh, happy to speak. So, very, very good. Trust. We're just going to go through really quickly. I know that uh, time is short and we've got lots of speakers, but uh, the infra grant program, um, this, is, this is one of those things. About 8 to 10% of the infra grant applications that are successful are maritime related. So we always like to remind our ports and our communities that uh, this is a great source of, of funding. Uh, and uh, it was funded uh, in the uh, in, in the new legislation. Uh, the raise grants uh, is also about that same same percentage. Uh, port projects are eligible. We're seeing it run to eight to ten, eight to twelve percent uh, year over year. So uh, you can see some of the some of the requirements for these grants. Um, and uh, just wanted to kind of highlight those. Uh, this is a little bit more about the raise uh, program. It used to be called Tiger and, and Build. Um, the Port of Structure Development Grant Program uh, was funded at 450 million per year over the next five years. And, uh, and it is the program run by the Maritime Administration along with the American Marine Highway Program. And uh, we've seen 230 million over the last couple of years, approximately. And uh, we've seen a steady increase in these grants. I think about one out of ten dollars applied for has has been granted. So it's a little bit better than the raise and infra grant program. But um, uh, with the with the increase of of money, we expect to see a lot more applications. Uh, we, I think, the first two years we had combined fifty two projects applied for, and then this last year we had over one hundred twenty. So uh, as this program gains traction, we expect to see a lot more uh, applications. Um, this is just a little bit of information about other USDOT resources. We have a loan program uh, that I'll talk a little bit about, or a couple loan programs. Uh, we have a port conveyance program. Uh, you can talk to Bruce Lambert at some point and uh, find out about all these opportunities uh, that we can we can do. This is just kind of a summary of the um, the TIFIA loan program, where you can borrow up to 33% of the program costs and use that as local match. Uh, so that's that's good. If you're doing the a railroad infrastructure, some ports have that. Uh, you can borrow up to 100% of those funds and also use those as local match. So uh, we have a, a port finance agent that works for me and, and he kind of guides the, uh, the applicants through those processes. Um, there is the National Highway Freight Program that's run through the states. Uh, th basically, this is a, a change to that program. It's, it's uh, Every state has to have a state freight plan, and up to 30% of those funds, uh, according to the new law, can uh, be used on intermodal projects. And so if you work with your state on the state uh, uh, transportation plan, you might uh, look and see if you can get 
considered for for those projects. Um, those are just some. I'm just going to go quickly, uh, but um, there there is a, a new emphasis uh, in the, the discretionary grant programs at the department. Uh, it's called the Justice Forty Initiative. You'll see this in the new funding opportunities notices. Uh, the president basically has declared that at least they would like to see 40% of the overall benefits of federal investment go to benefit disadvantaged communities. Uh, there's some tools that are available on the uh, notice of funding opportunities. You'll see some links, but just keep that in mind as you reply to every uh, notice of funding opportunity. Each time, each round, there's slight differences in the uh, in the in the notices. Just because you did something last time, don't just reuse it completely. Try to look and see what the requirements are and, uh, and fulfill those. And this is one of those new requirements I just wanted to highlight. Um, or just, uh, just a little bit of information about those. Um, there's the uh, bipartisan infrastructure law or, or, or uh, anyway, here's some, there's, there's a lot more money out there, uh, not just through the DOT, You'll see U.S. Army, uh, U.S. Corps of Engineers, uh, Coast Guard, uh, Federal Highways running the Reduced Truck Emissions Program, and then there's additional money for ferry boats and terminals. Uh, so there's uh, 17 billion dollars plus all the money we've got. Over 20 billion dollars in this bipartisan infrastructure law. Uh, here's some major changes to the service transportation block grant. This is a, it was described by the state DOT. This is the most common uh, program for transportation improvements. But one of the things that was changed in the law uh, that you should be aware of is that up to 5% of those funds can be used uh, for barge structures um, in, in, in the state. So it just expands that eligibility. And I just wanted to highlight, highlight that as an opportunity uh, the National Highway Freight Program, again, it went from 10% for intermodal projects to 30%. Uh, there's that new uh, mega projects um, category that uh, basically funds those programs or those projects over $100 million. Uh, this is a new discretionary grant program. And then the um, basically the, uh, the, the, the build program or the, uh, it was or the raise grant program it's codified. Basically, it used to be an annual uh, something that Congress would do, and now they've they've made it a continuing program. So you'll see that uh, in perpet you know until they change the uh, change the laws. Um, we do have this as a, a resource. Uh, the uh, it's a funding guidebook. It's several. I think it's over 100 pages of, of potential grant programs. That uh, this is uh, just a resource that we have. Um, we have developed a port planning investment toolkit that guides applicants through um, you know, how, to, how, how, to, how to plan a project, how to do its feasibility, and how to finance it. We did this with the APA, and uh, it's a resource we have linked here. Uh, the, the department also has uh, special resources for uh, applicants to help them. This is uh, developed for rural areas, but it just uh, gives you a kind of a one-stop shop to to learn how to apply for competitive grant programs. And uh, these are some links that it has on there, active funding opportunities, uh, resource toolkits, the funding matrix, uh, there's the B uh, benefit cost analysis um, instructions, links and things like that. So anyway, as I said, we've got way too many slides, but this is our contact information. And uh, you can reach out through, through these contacts and or through Bruce Lambert, and we'll be glad to help. Thank you, Travis. What we'll do is we'll just hold questions until uh, all the panelists have gone through. So you want to give Danny the remote? You can go ahead and load Danny's presentation. Thank you. So my computer just died. So I'm going to wing this without my notes, but it's also there just so I feel like I'm talking to a camera because that's what I've become more comfortable with over the last couple of years. Well, at least we know that the, your living room does not have a screen behind it uh, with all the other calls that everybody does. Yeah. So I pared down my slides quite a bit. Um, for those that don't know about the Tribal Transportation Program, it's a program jointly administered by both the Bureau of Indian Affairs and Federal Highway Administration Office of Tribal Transportation. Um, by our, from the Federal Highway side, it's a relatively new program. We came into it under Safety Lou in 2006. 
uh, or 2005, that's when it, we became an option for tribes to pursue administration of the program through us. Uh, we service all 574 um, federally recognized tribes. Uh, altogether, that's about what was the title? Um, bill overview. Mm -hmm. All together with consortiums, that's about 540 tribal entities uh, with federal highways working with about 120 of those and the rest working with BIA still. I, I sent it off. Okay, well, we'll just pass the Linda and we'll get the slide. <laughs> What is it Robert says? More maximum flexibility under all things? Okay, so we'll just, uh, we'll get the slides. We'll figure out what's going on. Hi, everybody. I'm Linda Gerke with the Federal Transit Administration out of, out of Seattle. And we have uh, four states in the region, Alaska, Idaho, Oregon, and Washington. And I wanted to give you a little comparison based off of the lunchtime conversation in that uh, we have 20 employees for the four states. And if you compare this to FHWA, they have one state or one grant for each state, and they have about 150 people. And we have 107 grantees, of which 60% are tribes, and we have the most up here in Alaska. So uh, just kind of a little overview of FTA. The other thing I wanted to mention is that um, in 2019, we, our region gave out $600 million. In 2020, we gave out 2 billion, and now we're up to 2.5 billion in 21. So the money's definitely coming through and trying to get out. We have a special tribal transit program. Um, I can give slides to have on the website when I'm done. I just didn't print them out right, correctly. And that um, this year we'll have 893 million in tribal and rural grant formula money to, for people to apply to. Uh, priorities for the administration, our administration, is safety, modernization, climate, and equity. And then I wanted to add on to the conversation about the TIFIA loans. They do have a target for rural areas. So you, if you're going to go out and look for the TIFIA loan, I think it's like at 1% interest now or something super, super low. Very competitive. Yeah, and they don't have very many rurals coming to look for it. So that might be something you want to look into. I also wanted to mention that the highway program, CRISA money, which is part of the, the emergency funding, that can be transferred to FTA. So it's highway money that you would transfer just like any other transfer flex fund. And we have done, oh gosh, I just forgot the number. We are getting money from highways to us to fund the uh, Inner Island Ferry Authority. So that money should be available soon as soon as they get the grant built and we're able to get that out. Also, um, there's a change in our, regulations related to the local hiring process. So um, you should go out and read that. It's now been codified so you can do local hire. And I don't have all the specifics, but I'll try to put it in the slideshow when I bring it out. And then um, a couple things that from the lunchtime, I just wanted to mention that when you compete for something like a raise grant, that we are asked to donate people to go and review all those proposals, hundreds of proposals. It's, you're never, you're not always going to have somebody that knows your project or knows the Marine or knows the tribal. So when you write it, you know, it might be my IT person that volunteers to go and rank them. And if it's an IT grant, great, but they don't put them into the mode pot until after they've all been rated. And then they decide what mode it goes to. So I would end up getting a, a, what do you call, a fatal flaw. And I would say, wait a minute, this Washington State Ferry, that's my project, but they're going to give it to Merritt. So it's very interesting to see how it really works. And there was just one more thing and I don't have my glasses on. Oh, I wanted to mention the different projects we've done so you can kind of see the breadth. Uh, we've worked on the Ketchikan shipyard. We've built ferries and vessels. Uh, we pay for ferry ops. We do tribal transit directly with the tribe. They do not have to go through the state for funding. There's a tribal transit pot and also their rural pot. And if they get, once they get rated through the rural pot under 5310 and 5311 program, they can ask to have the money directly from us so they don't have to deal through the state. Um, and then we do, uh, we're do we doing the electric terminals for the electric ferry that you're working on, the diesel one. And let's see, we do ferry boat terminals too. So 
that's kind of just an overview in a nutshell. Are you up? Nope. All right. Just in time. Perfect. <laughs> All right. So I'm just going to hit on a couple of the relevant changes to the tribal transportation program. You want me to just say next? Okay. So under bill, we are now going to be funded at $3 billion in contract authority from the highway trust fund. Um, previously, we were 2.425 under the FAST Act. We are the largest federal lands highway program. Um, we're seeing about an increase that's almost 25%. Um, and then we had some changes. So the vast majority of these funds, I'll have another slide here, but the vast majority go out as formula funds to the tribes. Sorry. Um, for safety, our set aside changed from 2% to 4%. So previously that was nine to $10 million annually. It's gonna be close to 22 million. That's doesn't include, we call that contract authority because it doesn't include the obligation limitation, which I think most folks are familiar with that is still in place for the tribal transportation program under bill. The HPP, high priority projects came back. Um, it was in the FAST Act. It was unfunded throughout the FAST Act. Now it has a 9 million annual set aside that's going to be funded um, from our, as a TTP set aside. And then this is our biggest change um, for bridges. So it's no longer a TTP set aside. It was 3%, which translated to roughly 14 million annually under the FAST Act. Um, as you can see now, we're gonna get um, $200 million from the bridge investment program and another $825 million in contract authority from the bridge formula program. That's over a billion dollars through the life of the bill. Um, that's a big change, a huge change for us. Um, we fully expect the bridge, the, the necessary bridges that needed to be funded, kind of the wait list, will be cleared out in the first year. So we are going to be needing bridge projects. Um, the other big change is what it's how, is just in the terminology. Um, it used to just replace and rehabilitate um, structurally deficient or functionally obsolete bridges. Now it will replace, rehabilitate, and construct bridges. Um, we are still waiting to see what some of that criteria looks like for the construct, um, but that is new. So before it was only to replace and rehabilitate structurally de deficient or functionally obsolete obsolete bridges on the national bridge inventory. Um, now it's going to potentially construct and then also change some of those terminology to um, those in poor condition, low, low, low rating, low rating or needing geometric improvements. So um, this is going to be a big area of funds. So if you have bridges in your areas, um, work with um, your, local entities. So hopefully the tribes can work with our local entities to get those on their inventory if they aren't already and take a look at those um, to see if what condition they're in now, make sure they're on the national bridge inventory. Um, and yeah, I mean, that's, this is kind of the big area. I mean, this is larger than our whole program already. So it's gonna become a big area. Um, of focus. We're hoping to administer this program, uh, but we will see how that shakes out. Um, there are a lot of people um, that would like to help us with that. Um, so this is just kind of a different way to look at the um, changes that we were talking about. So this is what it looked like previously under the FAST Act. Um, the 5% PMO that's for program management oversight um, functions that Federal Highways and BIA performs. The obligation limitation has changed. Um, like I said, unfortunately, that has not gone away. I think everyone that's familiar with the tribal transportation program saw that kept going up over the years through the FAST Act. Um, hopefully that is not the case again. But this is what those changes look like. The bridge program again is gone, funded separately. And then the high priority projects. Um, the high priority projects was around uh, previously. Um, before my time, I came on in 2014, um, but it has not been funded, like I said, for the last 
um, six, seven years. So they will be looking at that criteria again. And as soon as that's available, um, we'll be sending that out. The other big change is to the nationally significant federal lands and tribal projects program. Um, that's also administered by federal lands highways. Um, the funding is at 275 in contract authority, but some of the big changes for us are that it reduced the minimum eligible project from 25 million to 12.5 million dollars. Then it also modified the federal share. So previously a 10% um, match was required. Now for tribal projects, that's 100%. No match is required. Previously, tribal transportation program funds could not be considered federal funds or could not be considered non-federal funds for matching purposes. It was the only transportation um, grant program, excuse me, discretionary program that more, um, TTP funds were not allowed to be used. Otherwise, normally TTP funds are considered non-federal match, um, non-federal funds for matching purposes. So now that has also been changed for NSFLTP. And it requires an even split between tribal and federal lands projects. So previously, only, I believe there was only two tribal projects, two tribal applicants that received NSFLTP grants. Um, now half those awards need to go to tribal entities. So that's a huge change for us. Um, and we fully expect to see um, a lot of hopeful, hopefully a lot of applications come in and get awarded. Um, that last one's just um, of note, and that won't be hard for them to award to, a, to an NPS with greater than 3 million visitors. You've seen this plenty of times already. Um, just wanted to note, you know, tribes are able to be applicants to most of these grants. So, pursue those you know a lot of times the tribes can be applicants and a lot of times they're getting 100 percent um, funded with no match requirements and then the other thing i want to touch on is um, for those that don't know we have plenty of tribal staff here that are experts in this program but for those for those of you that aren't familiar with the TTP, we do have some key criteria. So if you're looking to work with the tribe in your area, uh, know that any of the projects pursuing that you wanna pursue and see whether your TTP, their T, the tribe's TTP funds can be used on a project. It has to be transportation related. That's not just surface transportation, of course, um, as you're all familiar with here in Southeast, that can include ferries, that can include um, ports, docks, but it does have to be a public facility. There's some exceptions there for administrative purposes for the tribe, but generally it's always has to be a public facility, which means it also has to be on the National Tribal Transportation Facility inventory um, that's managed by the BIA. It has to be on a tribe's approved TTIP. Um, as we just heard at lunch, make sure that the tip is up to date. And along with that, it has to be on a tribe's LRTP. So those go hand in hand. Your tip's going to be based off your long range transportation plan. So now is the time. I think you've heard that message plenty today um, and over the prior two days, I assume, that getting the planning done now, a lot of these programs that you see, we're still developing the criteria for. Uh, and I, by we, I mean the Royal USDOT. Um, we're waiting to hear ourselves, but um, getting that planning in place now is gonna set you up hopefully for success. Cause there is, um, as noted at lunch, there is going to be a lot of funds out there and hopefully the competitiveness um, will be less than it was before given that. Um, with that, questions will be at the end. Yes. It sounds to me like captain, you got a lot of bridges you're gonna to have to start inspecting in Southeast Alaska. Sounds good to me. <laughs> captain. Oh. Hey, um. <clears throat> Thanks for the invite to come here. Uh, I'm not like these really cool people next to me offering a lot of money. Um, <laughs> wish I was, um, but but I'm the regulatory arm of, of DHS and we used to be part of DOT. So I feel akin to, to our fellows and we really appreciate the work that Marad does and um, DOT does throughout the country. Um, I'm, I'm not your typical uh, sector commander. Um, 
if you look back there at Captain White, he can raise his hand. I'll make fun of him. <clears throat> He's good for it. I, he used to sail vessels all throughout Southeast Alaska. Um, I inspect the vessels that sailed throughout Southeast Alaska. That's been my job. I've done marine transportation for my entire career. I've looked at, at uh, your facilities, regulated facilities. I've done vessel inspections. I've done marine casualty investigations. I've looked at the marine transportation system as a whole in the Coast Guard. And, and for me, that's really where the Coast Guard can add some serious value to the system here in Southeast Alaska. And, and thankful for the opportunity to kind of bring that background. I, I may not be as good at search and rescue, but there are people who can do that. Um, I don't have to drive a boat. But what I can do is look at the marine transportation system and say, hey, we've, we've got some deficiencies. We've got some areas that we could make up. And the highway system that makes up Southeast Alaska is the marine industry. And barges really make moving cargo much more economic and environmentally friendly. Having the opportunity to move things by the waterway is good for the environment, it's good for the bottom dollar, and it's good for our country, to be frank about it. And so having that opportunity to work with that system for the last 23 years has been fantastic. I also do the pollution response and that kind of stuff growing up in the Coast Guard and having that opportunity has taught me how important it is to be prepared for things that might go wrong for people's worst days. And by doing that, by using some of these grants and some of these funding opportunities, we can have a more efficient, more effective, and a safer and more secure marine transportation system. That, that I just wanted to mostly let you know my background. Um, I, I really do see opportunities to grow here in Southeast. I, it really excites me when I see somebody coming in that's new, and I love to help walk them through the regulatory system. I had a guy come to me the other day and says, I wanna start uh, using the COI to, to do a passenger vessel. And I said, well, let me get you in touch with the smartest people there are, because it's not me. Um, but we, we, we were able to do that. We're able to work him through those systems so that he can figure out how to build the boat and make it regulatorily compliant and then be able to operate in a way that's safe and secure. And, um, and last of all, I, I just wanted to, to thank uh, Bruce for the opportunity to come here and to talk when he, when he, talk, when he asked me or told me that he was coming up here. He said, uh, what are you going to talk about? And I said, well, I'm going to be your cheerleader. Now I'm going to do it for the next year. I'm going to cheerlead at every port that I can to try to get as much information out there so that you guys can have the resources that you need to make Southeast Alaska the best that it can be. Because really that connection between our communities is critical and the waterway is what does it. When I get out on the water, that's how I like the tra transit. Uh, get to the chagrin of some people who plan my travel. I'd, I'd prefer to get on the water and I'd prefer to do it in my boat than do it in an airplane where I, I don't get the opportunity to see these lovely waterways to experience the Southeast Alaska. I've been here and working in Southeast Alaska for 10 years before I came to this assignment. Um, this is my 11th year being in Southeast Alaska and I, it's the place I love and will continue to love for the rest of my life. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you, Captain. Wow, it's like we should just stop right there and just drop the mic. But I really wanted Carl to speak because, you know, as a as the captain mentioned, he's a regulator. He he's looking to make sure it's safe and reliable. The other speakers are all trying to get you money, but we wanted actually Carl to speak because here's somebody who's gotten money, and I want him to talk about his you know kind of perspective, give some lessons learned, and things of that nature, just to uh, reinforce that these. It is, a, it is a task, but it is doable. So, Carl. Thank you, Bruce. Uh, for people that don't know me, I'm Carl Yucatel. Locally, I'm the port director here in Juneau. I've had this position for 10 years. In those 10 years, uh, we've executed about $180 million of new projects uh, at our downtown cruise ship docks and at our four harbors and uh, boat launch, six boat launches in, in Juneau. And uh, the, the takeaway, um, we have a, I have a saying that if, if we're not building, we're planning. And so I think that um, 
all of you in your respective communities, you've got to have a vision and you've got to uh, be your, you've got to be your biggest cheerleader. You have got to, and every opportunity when Don Young or Senator Sullivan or, or Murkowski or the governor come through, you have to talk to them and explain to them what, what your projects are. And uh, don't be afraid to uh, seek out and, and get professional services. Professional services, I, I'm just looking out at the, uh, the audience here and I see great engineering firms from Southeast Alaska and throughout Alaska in the room. You know, professional services will really help you, you know, execute your vision to make improvements to your waterfront or your airport, or um, nobody expects you to be an expert in everything you do in, in your, your village or your community, but there are smart people. You just need to find them. Professionals will pay for themselves if you get the right profession, professional. Um, you know, as far as you've been hearing a lot of money that's being bantered about by our, our federal partners, that is absolutely true. The, uh, the IIJA or the um, Bipartisan Infrastructure Law, that is transformational. That is a $1.2 trillion um, piece of infrastructure. You'll never see this. Everybody in this room will never see this amount of funding for infrastructure ever again. Um, and a trillion is, you know, I, I've, I've chased, I've been chasing grants that were a billion and I think, oh, billion, that's a lot of money. Certainly I'll be able to get something for my little community in Juneau and a trillion is a thousand billion. So there's a lot of money out there, but it just, it's not as easy as backing up your U-Haul to, you know, a federal building and, and raking the money in. There is a lot of work that goes into planning and executing and you've got to be persistent. You cannot just assume that your, your project is the one that when, when that board, I think everybody sits, all the, our federal partners sit on boards where they have to call the list of, of projects. It's a very difficult um, assignment to figure out what, what project rises to uh, the top of their list. And just don't assume that because everybody in Juno wants this project, that that's how they'll read it back in DC. So you gotta be persistent. You've got to follow the, the NOFO, the Notice Funding Opportunity to the letter. And a couple of folks were mentioning how that NOFO, when the grants come out, they change year to year and there's a little tweaks and you gotta be, you gotta recognize that. And if you don't have a grant writer or a grant expert on your staff, that's when go, go seek out and find that, uh, that professional services that will help you uh, achieve the best grant that you can uh, that you can uh, put out there, and again, be persistent. Is Haynesboro here? Okay, so Haynesboro, I, I think they were. Um, okay, Haynesboro, they were applying for a Tiger grant in 2009. And it wasn't until this last year, fiscal year 21 with the raise grant that they got 20 million for LUTAC doc. You know, they, they were, they were um, continually working that for over 10 years. And that's kind of, you gotta have the long game. You can't be disappointed if you get rejected. You've gotta play the long game. You gotta look at what the, what, what rules or what they're um, gonna be scoring on and, and change, refresh, market your, uh, your project, and it's always great to have a champion, right? So when they, when you're made, when any opportunity, when the governor, the senators, C Congressman Young come through, you know, let them know what you've got going on in your communities. The raise grant in 2021, it was a one billion dollar uh, grant opportunity. The state of Alaska, I think we were fourth in line as far as what states got money from raise. So out of that billion dollars. I think I think Alaska got like 50 million, which was um, like fourth on the list. We got more money than the state of Texas for raise grants. Um, Haines was successful. Cordova was successful. Um, I think Whittier got some money for a dock there as well. Um, but there there is a lot of money, but it's you got to work for it. Um, uh, as far as I can, I can mostly speak to port projects, but uh, I think somebody said, you, you know, port projects are get funded about 9% of the time. Well, I can, the, doing the forensics from 
this last round of raise grants, there were 90 grants that were selected. There was upwards of 800 applications. So just, you know, yeah, about a 10% chance of, of being selected. There's 10 times as many projects than there is money. Um, and there were only three port projects selected in the last raise grants, but two of them were in Alaska, Haines and uh, in Cordova. So we're doing well. Um, so lots of reasons to be optimistic. You know, the, the, the uh, BIL is really, it's, it's, there's money for the next five years, play the long game, um, fortune favors the prepared. So I think with that, I'll leave it at that. Well, Robert, I'm gonna give you the mic for questions and I'm gonna ask the first one as the privilege of the moderator. What do you think when you're engaged, what do you think when you're engaged with various people that you find is the, 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 the stumbling block to get them to really start putting in for applications or thinking through this planning? Is it awareness? Is it education? Is it staff? Is it workforce? What do you see as that first hurdle to get them moving from, you know, off of go for lack of a better word? Oh, yeah, I, I would just say that uh, just awareness is one of the big things, but also being, you know, most of these programs are designed for shovel ready projects. And so you need to have things on the shelf ready to go. You need to have kind of a vision that I've got these four or five projects are my top priorities. And every time there's a notice of funding opportunity, I want to look and see which of those projects is most likely to be submittable and then uh, try to massage it. But uh, but you know we 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 see that, you know there's a little bit of a slow uptake on uh, you know our PIDP grant program. Uh, we were wondering you know the first two years I think only 70 ports applied for uh, or or actually maybe out of the two year anyway it's we're 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 just trying to figure out you know how is it that we can increase the number of of quality projects coming in and uh, and then you know we're we're successful when when our ports are successful. Okay, here's the question. Are you in another answer? I was going to say something real quick. Okay. Yeah, I was just going to mention that um, we know that all of the folks here have small staff, but if you can make sure that your staff is trained and let us know if you're changing staff, that will help us keep things moving. I know we've talked a lot about discretionary money, but we do have formula funds, and there's a lot of formula money that's sitting on the table that nobody has applied for yet and especially on both the tribal and the rural pro projects. And then also um, ask us for help because we can help you build your grant to understand what's going in it, especially for the villages and tribes. I know the chairman's change a lot. And so we have to go into the electronic system and change the names and make sure everything's back up to date. So keeping us informed helps us help you get your money faster. Okay. Here we go. Yeah, Ron Curtis, Inner Island Ferry Authority. I, I believe my question is for Mr. Black. Um, in, in looking at your route map uh, for the uh, America's Marine Highway System, it appeared that uh, Route M5 uh, takes the outside route on Alaska. I was wondering if Route M5 also includes the inside waters of Alaska, like the inside passage, where I am a ferry operator that also uh, we, we run a ferry system that also takes containers as well as uh, cargo ships or cargo fans. So I was just curious if those waters were designated as part of the America uh, Marine Highway System. Yes, yes they are. Um, the screen for the mic. Yeah. The mic. I'll use my inside voice here. There we go. Okay, um, yes, it, they, the, the language in there, you know, we didn't have, we didn't want to go through and have to name every river and, and bay and channel, you know, so it's, it says something, there's some, some boilerplate language about uh, that uh, it's includes all bays, navigation, uh, navigable rivers, you know, and tributaries, et cetera, et cetera. So yes, all the, uh, the inland waterways along that, along the M5 Alaska are, are part of the, the system. So I know someone that's online that is uh, from a small community that's looking for, you know, like a crane on a 
a loading dock on the waterfront. So what, which, which program would you specifically aim for a small community that's looking to, for that type of infrastructure for freight? It depends on there's a tribe, if there's a public partner. Yeah, it's a, it's a um, actually in this particular case, it's a community association. Well, you know, there's, there is a number of different ways to skin the cat. I don't know why whoever came up with skinning a cat, to me, it doesn't sound like a fun thing to do, but it really looks at, at something that Carl said, who's the champion? Who's gonna do the local match? You know, is there Indian tribal money involved? Is it, is it private sector money involved? And, and it's so the answer to your question is it's doable, but we don't have enough information to really tell you specifically what's the three or four programs you might be looking at. Because sometimes, as Travis mentioned earlier, one NOFO, if you have a project that's ready, you tweak it this way for this NOFO. And then you say, well, wait, okay, if I tweak it this way for this NOFO, and there's nothing that says you can't put multiple applications in for the same project. And if for some odd reason you win multiple times, just pick one. But it's the idea, like Travis said, Carl said, know what you want to do. And that makes it a lot easier to find what the right project is. Who do I send them to? Send them to me and I'll. I don't know if Linda has anything she wants to say or, or Danny or anybody else so on that particular topic. No, I'll pass. I'll wait till somebody asks me about the uh, Alaska Marine Highway System. All right, Eric, so you heard that. You're going to contact Bruce about your crane over there. Okay. Because this is all online. That's why I give you the microphones. They can hear you on, well, online. Yeah. Travis to get, I mean, attempt, Perfect. So Other questions? Pelican need anything? This is the benefit of going late in the day. <laughs> the brain enduring, the brain stopping to absorb anymore. Thank you, Robert. And, and thank you, Robert, for this excellent day of training. I appreciate the work you put into bringing this to us, rural villages who are really underserved. Um, somebody mentioned it depends on if it's a formula funded request or so I don't know what that means if someone can explain that. Basically, we can, yeah, discretionary grants are administered by the department. And so they're issued through a notice of funding opportunity. And uh, basically, they define in that notice of funding opportunity who's eligible to apply. It's normally a nationwide kind of competition where a formula grant program is going to be allocated to a particular region based on characteristics of that region. Uh, so maybe it's going to be a state formula grant program where uh, the state has allocated certain dollars based on population, mileage of, of facilities, number of bridges, number of fatalities, different uh, different criteria. But the transit program probably has a little bit better definition for your programs. But yeah. Our, uh, yeah. for the uh, transit programs, there's both a state, there's an urban, and then there's a tribal formula. And uh, you have to put information into what's called the National Transit Database. And from that, they generate what the formula is. So for a tribe, I think the lowest we have in the formula is $5,000. And I think the highest is almost a million, depending on your population, uh, where you live and that type of thing. So the apportionment notice for FTA just came out, I wanna say February 2nd or February 4th. You can go out to our website and it will tell you what your tribe got or what your uh, state got, because there's nobody here that's in an urban area, I think. Um, and that would give you an idea what the state is gonna work with to be able to pass down to all the individual entities. Whereas the discretionary, as you said, it used to be called earmarks. You could go to your congressperson and they would earmark something for you, but discretionary is competitive and it is national and it has criteria that changes every year. And while I have the mic, I didn't mention the one piece on the ferry system. That's new under bill. I see, I can't do anything without my glasses. Um, it's called the Ferry Service for Rural Communities. And I wanted you to know that uh, this was a particular favorite of Senator Murkowski. And she worked really hard for everybody to um, make the criteria mean that it has to be for service that goes over 50 miles. So the eligible applicants that could possibly come in for it is Guam to the Northern Marianas territories. Key West to Dry Tortuga, American Samoa, and the Alaska Marine Highway. And it's getting $200 million a year for the next five years, and you can use it for capital and operations. So 
I had heard lots of rumblings about, you know, the ferry, the ferry, the ferry. I just wanted to make sure that everybody knew that we're going to work with the National Marine Highway System and the commissioner on making sure we can get that money out as fast as possible. It is a competitive program. It will be announced in April ish, April, May, and it won't, it will be, NOFA will come out in April, May, and then it will uh, be announced on who gets the money in October ish. But interesting. Thank you. you might want to send a thank you note. And I would yeah. just, yeah. I would just say that all those discretionary grant programs, uh, the, the things I've been seeing is we'll be seeing notices of funding opportunity. The first one came out, uh, I think the 15th of, of, uh, of February or of January. Uh, usually you'll have 60 to 90 days to respond to those, but uh, we expect all of these to come out sometime between now and summer. Uh, so there's really, it's going to be a flood of money and almost all of them are funded every year for the next five years. So uh, if you don't make it this time, just be ready. And, and I really applied HDR. They were talking about that uh, debriefing when you were your are successful. We have a really good staff that really wants you to succeed, and they will tell you exactly what they saw, how you can make your application better. Of course, you're going to have to respond to the notices, the changes, but uh, they want to. They, they will give you a really honest opinion about what your project looked like to the to staff and and how you can make it better. All right. Here's our. Oh, go ahead. I just also like to add, since you mentioned that. Um, FTA's tribal notice of funding availability will be coming out hopefully the end of February. That will announce funding that you can compete for. And then um, the bus and bus facilities, which can work for any kind of capital project, uh, will probably be coming out in the end of March. So keep your eye out for those. And if you can sign in to, uh, what is it, government.gov? Grants.gov. Grants. 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 Then you can already get an automatic notification and you need that for your raise grants anyway. So yeah. sign up. All right, final qu our final question is? Uh, Ann Morrison from the city and borough of Wrangell, which has been talked about, I guess. <laughs> uh, I just have a question. If a clarification first, if, if the money comes through a native corporation or a tribe, they can get 100% fund or 100% loan. Is that correct? Loan? If, if it's tribal money well, for the it depends on the the program there's there's some of the new programs coming up like NSFLTP. if they're the applicant they're awardee they they'll get a hundred percent federal share so they don't aren't required to do the ten percent match okay so so there's no matching so what if it's a what if it's a joint effort between uh, a native corporation and say a municipal a municipality um ultimately that might depend on how um a tribe is defined in that programs. Okay. You know, in our program, a corporation is still defined as a tribe. Yeah, and I will add that for the tribal transit program, that's the formula one. It's 100% uh, with no local match, but you only can do 10% uh, for your indirect rate. When you compete, you can use your real indirect rate on that tribal discretionary program. And then we don't do corporations. They're not eligible for FTA's funding. So if you wouldn't want it to come together, just have them apply and you guys work out an agreement between the two of you. Well, first of all, I'd like to thank our panelists. And, and as I said earlier, you know, we're, uh, we're up here and we're trying to find ways to get more resources out. I'm definitely getting more information to the Coast Guard so he can he can have that available for him. And before I forget, I had a discussion yesterday with somebody about the, the port security grants are coming up. And if you have cybersecurity needs or other things like that, that NOFA will be coming out and you talk to the captain uh, about those eligibilities to improve you know, some of the security, whether it be lighting, cybersecurity, emergency response, things of that nature. And those are public and private grants. So it can be anybody can basically apply for those grants and they'll be coming out fairly soon. It's a DHS program. So I did want to make a plug for that. And the captain's the one that oversees those grants for this area. So uh, tell them what your needs are from a security perspective. Thank y'all. All right, thank you. Okay, now that is a lot of information, a lot of resources, and now personal connection with the folks that can help you through that process. And speaking of a lot of resources, our next uh, speaker is going to be Miles Baker, who is the Infrastructure Investment Coordinator for the Office of the Governor. 
So Miles, if you want to come on uh, this way, I was thinking uh, as you were getting ready to come up, I think, gosh, it's been nigh on to uh, 20 years now that I've, I've known Miles and uh, he has had key roles as staff in the Senate, uh, both at the state level and at the federal level. He's been involved in uh, key roles in economic development projects and he's been involved at the university and so many different areas. It gives him a wide perspective that uh, I think he, it's a perfect person for this role here. And I just appreciate you coming and talking about what's out there. So Absolutely. thank you. Thank you sir. See ya. Okay. I do have a, can you guys see that? Okay. So uh, thanks for having me. And I um, I know the, I'm the last guy of the three well, days. Guy, so, um, so I, I know people are tired and, and um, that's a hard act to follow with all these, all of our federal partners. Um, but I just wanted to come talk a little bit about uh, what we're doing in the governor's office to, to uh, try to understand this, this federal um, legislation and uh, what it means for Alaska. And um, we are obviously in a legislative budget cycle. So uh, one of our um, sort of the forcing function for us right now is to understand what uh, is in there that would come through the state of Alaska. And one of, one of the things I've been talking about is sort of big, big S state versus small S state, um, because there is a lot of funding, a lot of opportunities for the state of Alaska uh, generally that are not going to come through the, the state budget. Um, and so, of course, uh, everyone wants to sort of understand what that means and what those different funding streams are and, and who qualifies for them. Um, and we're certainly working on that and trying to understand that. But we um, our, our priority is to get to the legislature what they need um, for this coming FY23 uh, state fiscal budget cycle. And I got to tell you, it's a monumental task. Uh, I have been working on this for about two months uh, since the governor moved me over here. Uh, I was the legislative director um, last year. So I spent most of my time down here um, on point for the governor's um, policy side of things. Uh, I really, this has been a great new role. It, it sort of takes me back to a lot of other stuff I've done in the past. And so it's, it's a very interesting project, um, but it's, it's a pretty, pretty mon monumental. So one of the things we just, so, should I just hit the arrows here? Yeah. Do I have to turn it on or something? Sorry. Maybe it's just not on. Um, one of the things that, uh, oh, you just hit the, okay. Um, one of the jo jobs is just, is sort of public expectation setting uh, on this, this legislation because people have seen the, the high level, top level national numbers, the $1.2 trillion and, you know, a, a whole series of press releases coming out. Um, from the delegation, from different trade associations, from the federal agencies about estimates of what might come through Alaska. Um, and so, and then coming on the heels of three stimulus bills, uh, there's sort of a little bit of an expectation, this is this, the next stimulus bill, and it's not. Um, it will certainly have huge economic benefit and stim stimulative effects. Uh, for the state over a number of years, um, but it is much less discretionary uh, in terms of um, what we ex sort of got in the last three stimulus bills in, the, in terms of the governor and the legislature having discretion to take federal money and sort of create, um, create you know, business relief grants to uh, take federal money and a substitute loss revenue for the state. We could literally take some of that last tranche of, of stimulus funding and offset state general fund spending. Um, so 
very discretionary. Uh, you know, there was a billion dollars the, the, you know, the ARP bill, the legislature appropriated 500 million of that last year. There's another 500 million that needs to be appropriated in this current cycle. Um, and, and, you know, it was pretty broad of what you could use this for. Um, this, this is, you know, largely directed by federal agencies or within federal programs that, that, that already exist on um, the eligibility of those programs, what qualifies, the, the matches, different things changed um, because what I have to sort of remind the folks in the legislature is at the federal level, you can change law and you can appropriate in the same bill. This does all of those things. It, it, it authorizes programs, it appropriates to programs, it over appropriates to programs, it advance funds for five years programs um, other programs are just authorized. There's no appropriation. It's all over the map, um, but it's largely, uh, it's a reauthorization of surface transportation um, and our public works programs that come through EPA. Uh, so the, the revolving loan programs, the village safe water program, um, it's a huge new investment in broadband through the Department of Commerce. And then it drops off significantly from there. Those are the three sort of big areas. There's cybersecurity that was mentioned, um, the federal agencies, the federal land managers, which of course in Alaska is, is a lot. Um, they, they are getting money um, to, you know, in some cases, improve access to federal lands, to remediate environmental cleanup on federal lands. Um, and so there will be money that comes through our federal partners that impacts Alaska, but again, doesn't necessarily come through the state, um, but our state agencies in partnership, either through cooperative agreements or um, designated decisions made by the secretary of those departments, you know, can determine where some of that money goes. Um, there's no real earmarks in this bill. Uh, Congress is sort of moving back to this idea of congressionally designated spending, as they call it, but that's in the appropriation process. Um, this has gotten a little confusing because the Corps of Engineers uh, announced their construction schedule for the coming year with a lot of money for Alaska, which is amazing. Um, and it came, and it was the first year of the five-year funding that the Corps got for their civil construction program. And so you saw the Port of Nome uh, show up. You saw um, the Kenai River Bluff um, project. Uh, the Lowell, Lowell Creek diversion project in Seward. Um, and so the sort of public perception is, oh, there was earmarks in this bill. Um, and those were long time planned. You know, those were sort of projects that are now coming out of the course process because they have enough federal money to move those forward. Um, they weren't specifically mentioned in the bill, you know, as kind of an earmark. So that's something that's been a little hard to communicate um, let me, let me move along here. So, so, uh, you know, the bipartisan infrastructure law is, is sort of how uh, the feds are starting to talk about this. Um, and it's really about a billion dollars. And, and again, these are rough numbers, but, but, uh, 43% of that is for programs that already existed that have now been reauthorized. Congress typically in five-year chunks will reauthorize programs. And we hadn't had a surface transportation reauthorization. We hadn't had the public works reauthorization. And so that became the foundation of this infrastructure bill. And then on top of that is, is this 550 billion of new spending. So, so when you look at the analysis of the bill, you'll tip, typically see people focused on that 550 number because that's kind of the new stuff. I mean, that's, that's the, you know, if Congress hadn't passed an infrastructure bill, that's the stuff that we wouldn't have. The other stuff we would expect that at some point Congress would have passed. Um, so just another way to look at this, and this is sort of a, a concept I, I stole from McKinsey, this is how they had sort of presented it in one of theirs. But, you know, the dark blue is, is the total spending in the bill the light blue is sort of the new stuff. And the new stuff is, is largely split. The whole bill is pretty much about 50% transportation related, but the new stuff is split sort of evenly there between um, 
uh, transportation, and then let me just make sure I got my notes here. Um, transportation, and then sort of this other infrastructure, which uh, we'll sort of walk through. Um, another, some other ways to look at it. You saw the, our federal partners up here. Um, so the, again, this is the 550 new spending, and you see it there um, by agencies. So you see that USDOT um, and all of its different um, organizations with the bulk of the money. Uh, you see Department of uh, EPA there with the um, revolving loan programs. The uh, there is some new emerging contaminants. So for PFOS, uh, that's a big thing in Alaska. So there's some dedicated funding for to address PFOS and, and other emerging contaminants. There's a lot of money for lead line replacement water. Um, my understanding from sort of our DEC experts is there's not a lot of that in Alaska because we're a fairly new state, but that's been a big problem nationally. So there's a lot of money there. Um, Energy, I, I failed to mention energy at the beginning. Energy is another big pot of money, clearly that Alaska could potentially benefit from. Um, so the Department of Energy. Commerce, again, most of that money there in commerce is the broadband money. Um, interior is the um, uh, USGS, um, BIA, a, a lot of, um, uh, I would say, you know, generally, uh, there's a lot of directed money to, to tribes. Um, and then there's the tribes are eligible for most of the other grants as well. Um, so uh, a lot of opportunity for um, um, tribal interest in Alaska. Uh, Homeland security uh, is mostly FEMA and cybersecurity, uh, but a lot of that FEMA money is directed south uh, for for storm mississippi delta you know coastal florida sort of that sort of um stuff and then you see the the balance there uh another way to to look at it is sort of by by category again this is the the new spending piece um and so one of the things you hear mentioned a lot in this bill is this concept of resiliency um and, and so I, I think everyone's like, well, what does that mean? Um, and it's basically making infrastructure more resilient to the impacts of climate change and cyber attacks. So um, most of these programs as they've been reauthorized are now going to be required if you're building a new road or you're building um, a new uh, project that, that receives federal funding. The expectation is that you are building it with, with climate impacts in mind um, and that you, um, to the extent it's vulnerable to cyber attacks, so if it's on the power grid or those sort of things, that those are considered. Um, and so, um, but in that category uh, is all the money. There's, there's wildfire mitigation money in here too, which I think would be, that's sort of in the resiliency category um, through the Department of Interior. And then environmental remediation is mostly um, addressing legacy pollution. Um, and a lot of this is on federal land. In Alaska, the first thing we know we're going to get and that this will be, um, um, you know, I, I failed to mention one of the things the governor will be doing is within the next several weeks, we will introduce a separate appropriation bill um, to, to have those items that, as I mentioned, we think will come through the state um, in the next budget year. And so one of those we know is that um, we will be getting through the Department of Interior's uh, well, this new orphan well uh, plugging program. And there's a separate program for wells on tribal land. Um, there's a separate program for wells on federal land. And then there's a program for wells on state and, pri um, state and private land. And so that's the one that has gotten the most, uh, it, we've got the most information on, we've already got our, our estimated allocation and AOGCC is sort of in charge of, of, of working on that program. Um, but it's about, uh, I wanna say $54 million in the 50, mid fifties. To We've got 12 known uh, wells that need to be plugged. Um, I, I did want to touch on, you know, one of the things that's complicated, not only in the idea that that this bill authorizes programs, but also appropriates programs and does it differently, you know, uh, 
depending on the whim of the of the Congress and the program. Uh, some of the, so, but Congress has not passed the FY22 appropriation bill. In fact, this morning I read that they're going to extend the CR, which expires on the 18th, probably to March 11th, the minimum. And some of the new programs for this group, one of the most critical is this new Federal Transportation Administration rural ferry program that the um, the director mentioned, which we still don't have the, the guidance on that yet, but all signals are that the bulk of that funding will come to the state of Alaska. And it's a new program that's been authorized for five years and the entire five years has been appropriated in this bill. It's a billion dollars, $200 million a year. Um, and the expectation, we, we now have a federal program specifically to fund the marine highway system that we would expect to be reauthorized again in five years um, at the next time around. So that is huge, but because it's a new program, it is restricted under the um, Congress's continuing resolution. It's considered, because uh, so, there's no new starts. The agencies are not allowed to start new programs, even though in this case, FTA has a billion dollars in the bank from Congress in essence for this new program for the next five years. They can't start the new program until the FY22 appro cycle is, is finished. Um, and so that's that one's a challenge for us because we have plugged 135 million of that money into our budget this year. Uh, we are that confident that we will see that money and that money could increase. Um, and our understanding at this point is that that money is available for capital as well, capital and operations. So we can now don't have to take out of our fed highways surface transportation pot of money to necessarily build our new boats uh, we can access this new funding stream as well to build new boats so that's a huge uh and that's a hat tip to the delegation who's worked on this for a long time um uh generally the other thing is important to know that a lot of this is coming from formulas and as i think these guys touched on they're either apportioned out by statute by statute or they're allocated out sort of at the discretion of whatever department it is so there's there's both that we would consider formula and then there's grants um and some of those grants will be competitive discretionary grants and some will be uh more at the discretion of the program administrators. So um, it's, 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 you know, it, but, but, and there's a little bit of loans uh, authority primarily for energy projects. Um, and then of course, a lot of these come with federal match and there was a discussion about the tribal, a lot of the, the, you know, generally some of the tribal programs have less of a match or even are allowed to use hundred percent of federal funding for the project. Um, and, uh, but, you know, those Corps of Engineers projects, for example, um, require 25 to 35%. So the Port of Nome project is a huge project that the Corps is probably going to, um, you know, spend $500 million on over the next uh, couple cycles if we can come up with the non-federal match. And it, the non-federal match requirement just for that first phase is I've got a slide on it, it's like $160 million. So um, anyway, I'll move, move along here, but these are, these are some of the stuff in the transportation side. Um, uh, I would say, you know, the airport stuff, we, Alaska is incredibly competitive on that. And so as a result that we do really well with the airport construction anyway, um, I don't, we don't see that that, you know, those big construction discretionary AIP construction dollars necessarily will increase, but um, the, uh, the formula side, the entitlement, what they call entitlement, FAA language, they go out as a result of passenger um, traffic and cargo, and th those numbers will go up. This electric vehicle infrastructure is a new big program. Um, it's, a, it's a federal highway administration program. It has a boast of both a formula component and a competitive grant component. Uh, we have already put in comments on that. Um, one, I guess, in the, in the advice column is um, signing up and really monitoring these federal notices from the different agencies because 
one of the odd things about this bill was that even though it's not really a stimulus bill, um, there was really strict deadlines put in there by Congress, you know, within 30 days of enactment, within 60 days of an enactment, and that passed on November 15th. So over the holidays, you had all sorts of federal notices coming out for a bill that's going to have a five to six year impact. It was just kind of crazy. But the more I, I looked in, you know, that that's why is because for whatever reason. And so I just say that because there's a lot of um, notices going out that aren't the funding opportunity, but they're the, the federal agencies are like, hey, we, you know, this is new to us too. tell us what you think. And Alaska needs to comment on those programs so that when the funding opportunities happen, we're gonna be more competitive for them. And so we've already had to reply to some, one of which was the electric vehicle program. So AEA, Alaska Energy Authority has the lead on that for the state right now. Um, DOT is going to have to identify what our alternative energy ready corridors are um, um, in order for us to start seeing that money. Um, it's not a lot of money, but it's like $50 million over five years for, you know, a whole new thing. Um, and uh, so that's tons of money in here for, for buses, uh, electric, basically non, any sort of um, bus, whether it's school buses, local buses, uh, to replace diesel buses. Tons of money. Uh, I mean, $8 billion. Is that what it says? Um, and it's everything, and, and, and I don't know how helpful that's going to be to Alaska in places where, you know, we don't, electric buses don't really make sense, but in some places, you know, we, we should see some good benefit. Um, those will be things that the state probably won't be involved in. Uh, we're not currently really in the school bus business. I'm not sure why my thing is not moving. Robert, can I get an assist on this again? I don't I'm not sure. Oh, there we go. Um, in terms of the sort of the other big spending categories, I've sort of touched on this stuff already, just to give you a sense. I tried to sort of highlight the sort of the more Alaska specific things. So I think if we get our act together and coordinate, um, again, and I say that because it's 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 not necessarily, you know, in the case of the power stuff, uh, it's, it's going to be the, the utilities. It's going to be the rail belt utilities. It's going to be getting with AEA and the Bradley Lake, you know, project. And there's a ton of money for resiliency, modernization of our, of our uh, transmission. Um, there's not really money in here for uh, construction of new generation. Um, there's some hydro efficiency money, but if you're looking to sort of build a new hydro plant or something, it's not not in here. Um, just to give the, the thing we have the most information on at this point is the, the standard federal highway, uh, Fed aid highway programs. Um, and this is the national number, but I just I just I illustrate this because over five years, Alaska should get in this program about three and a half billion dollars. Okay, and, and that's, the, um, that's the surface transportation block grant program. That's the money the DOT uses for all of the construction of roads. It's the transportation alternative set sides. It's the, it's the track program. It's, um, there's, a new, there's two new programs. There's a congestion mitigation program, and there's one called the protect program that has a formula and a grant, and that is a I've got the acronym somewhere, but it's 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 erosion, it's evacu emergency evacuation routes, it's it it's it sounds like something that on coast in coastal Alaska could be very beneficial. It's not a lot of money, um, but my point is, it's three and a half billion dollars for Alaska over five years. But you have to back out of that what we already would have gotten when Congress reauthorized the bill, and so. Yes, there's a big bump in the first year, um, and I'm going to show, but then it just increases. This is the authorization that Congress, it basically goes up by 2% a year. So you, you kind of have to, um, and so this is the DOT piece. Um, so this, you see at the, at the bottom there, um, 
trying to illustrate, this is sort of the reality check piece of the presentation um, we talked to the legislature about with is, so you see all the programs there on the left, National Highway Program, Surface Transportation Block Grant, Highway Safety Improvement, Railroad Grade Crossings, uh, Metropolitan Planning for AMATs and FMATs and Anchorage, Fairbanks. But you see the bump there. So that's our base spending in the current year. And that's the Delta there, um, which is only, it's about a 20% increase. Um, so it's a it's hundred, and I say only, I, I don't mean to diminish it, but it's, it's it, you know, we're bumping up about a hundred and hundred million dollars. And then when you break that out into these, these restrictive programs that are, they're very prescriptive, um, you know, you start seeing much smaller numbers. So the surface transportation block grant program is the most flexible of our federal highway monies. And, um, you know, that's, that's going up by $20 million. So over the five years, we'll have $100 million more in that really flexible pot. That's the money that DOT works with local communities for all of the projects that are not federally owned or state owned. And, and, you, and in the bill, Congress, I think I could say radically, radically increased the eligibility for that program. Rural barge landings, seasonal and ice roads, um, tourism facilities, whatever that means. Um, and so everyone has looked at that program like, wow, look at all this stuff. And it's great. I mean, we've never been able to use federal dollars for an ice road um, or for a barge landing, but it's, it's that program. It's a, it's a small, you know, when you start drilling down into the individual pots, it's not a lot of money and there's a lot of need out there. So um, the, you know, the, the legislature and I think the public is, 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 is what, what I've said sort of in the building is this is not capsis on steroids. This is not put in vertical community fire halls, uh, community centers and stuff that there's not money in this bill for that sort of thing. Um, and so, the, and then of, of the money there is for, you know, roads and, and, and uh, water and sewer projects and stuff, it's, um, you know, it's, it's still within largely those, those constraints. Um, I will say the one area that is massive um, is the rural, rural water programs. And for those of you, probably many people in the audience are more familiar with those programs and how they work than I am. Um, but it's, it's fairly complicated. The Village Safe Water Program, which is about $40 million a year was reauthorized. That's a direct, appropriation that comes from Congress specifically for that program, DEC manages it. it. That didn't really go up. It's been reauthorized, but it's still about $40 million a year. Um, but the money that comes in through the Indian Health Service uh, is massive. Um, it's three and a half billion dollars over the five years. And the estimates I've heard is as much as two billion of that will come through to Alaska. And so what you see here is that the, the, um, you see that blue jump, that blue in the, in the top bar there. These are the different funding sources for the rural water programs. USDA is involved. Um, and, but you, know, you see that $400 million bump um, that's probably, that's coming through the Indian Health Service um, domestic, I forgot what they call it. It's the Domestic and Community Sanitation Program. Um, and so all of those work in conjunction, but you know what, what the delegation has said and what we've heard from Washington is this, this is intended to sort of clear the books of um, you know, getting all of our communities on safe uh, water and sewer projects. But I think all of us know what a, what a huge task that will be. So that, that is um, definitely a, a big benefit for Alaska. I did want to put a plug in here for the governor's geo bond bill. Um, we get a lot of questions about why are we considering borrowing money when we've got this huge infrastructure bill? And I would say, well, because the stuff in the geo bond bill um, is, can't be funded with the infrastructure bill. 
These are um, these are state more state and community priorities. These this is either provide this is going to provide match for some of those big federal projects. Um, it will it will incentivize the feds to move those projects up on their priority list if, if we can show the state has the match or is starting to get the match. Um, it gives us more flexibility on executing the projects. Um, and it's just a good financial deal uh, right now to um, borrow um, and um, use the general funds, either you know, investing and growing. Um, and so uh, Bert Cottle, who many of you may know uh, through AML or through this organization is, is working for the governor now and specifically doing outreach to mayors um, sort of his job is to do the Rolodex of mayors and then start over again and, and have a better communication with our local governments on what their needs are. But he's also talking a lot about this geo bond bill, trying to get local community support, uh, the port of Anchorage, um, you know, Port McKenzie um, is in there. The port of Nome is in there. There's other projects in there. So I would encourage you guys to support that or have questions about it. Let us know. Um, and but we just wanted to point out that that this infrastructure bill and the money coming into Alaska isn't going to negate uh, the need for that geo bond bill. Um, a couple, I just wanted to point out a couple things that that are important for us. Um, the Alaska Gas Line, you know, we and I, I worked for AGDC for three years, so um, that, that I'll never get back. Um, but all of us have followed this project one way or another for years. Um, and and when, the, when the federal law was originally passed, uh, there were $18 billion of loan guarantees that are, you know, sort of, I've been telling people it's like a VA loan. You still have to go borrow the money and pay it back. But because the federal government has the, that veterans back in the event there's a problem, they get a better interest rate because they've got that federal guarantee. That's what this is, but but the guarantee was when the bill was passed, the assumption was that the Alaska gas line was taking gas to the lower 48. And we've, been, we've tried for years to get that tweaked so that it would apply to what is envisioned now, which is you know an LNG export project. Um, so that that may seem small, but that, that's big um, in that it, really improves our, our opportunities, you know, to the extent they're out there to get financing for that project. Um, so AGDC um, is doing a good job on that. Um, the Trump administration introduced a number of reforms in federal permitting that um, have been ve were very successful uh, and, and huge for Alaska in terms of the complication of a large project and the number of federal permits you need um, that most of those were repealed by the Biden administration. Um, they were put back in this bill and, and passed. This is, you know, one of the ways I think they were able to get some some of the Republican support um, in other parts of the country for this bill. And so uh, we're not going to see the immediate impacts of that. But the idea is that you, you've got one federal agency that has to be in charge of the of the of the the um, permit. So whether it's the Corps, whether it's FERC. All the other agencies have to be on the same timeline, and uh, the goal is to get it done within two years, um, those big permits. So that's big. Uh, we have tried for a long time to do local hire provisions in some of our big transportation projects, and this is I know, huge in parts of, of um, your communities where when these big projects come in, very frustrating to see. Um, a huge um, cadre of, of folks coming from other parts of the state or, or in the lower 48. And we have been restricted on doing any sort of local hire preference for, for federal transportation projects. That was removed in this bill. Um, and so uh, at the same time, the Biden administration has put in a project labor agreement uh, executive order here recently for the larger federal funded projects, 35 million and above, um, which you know, I know it doesn't apply to a lot of what we're going to do, but so that's big uh, secure rural schools, which I know is important to uh, a lot of Southeast. Um, this is the money that comes in in the absence of timber, um, timber stumpage fees and, and harvest of, of the forest, national forest. Uh, it, it is a program that, that Western states in Alaska have had to fight for 
continually to keep this funding stream. Uh, it has been reduced. There's sort of a formula and Congress has reduced it over the last, you know, like, oh, we're only, only gonna pay 70% of the formula. We're only gonna pay. And uh, so it's been reauthorized and it's back to the, the 100%. Um, at least for the next five years or five years. So uh, I think I'm just going to power through this. This slide deck will be available. This is, you know, as we still haven't been able to sort of drill down on all these things, but, uh, you know, these are some, some things that we know are important that I pulled out of the bill for Alaska uh, on the energy and power side. Um, uh, some of the stuff we've touched on, on Alaska Native and Tribal. Um, interests, uh, you know, not a lot of money there for community relocation and for the uh, tribal climate resistance, but resiliency, but you would expect that um, a lot of that's coming to Alaska. Um, again, the federal land management agencies should see um, um, money coming through that if we, our agencies work well with our federal partners, uh, we should be able to do, do good stuff with. Uh, and I guess in conclusion, I, you know, the, the themes of this bill, I, I, I guess, having studied it for, for the last two months uh, as a full-time thing, you know, equity, uh, resiliency, you know, and equity there, and, you know, is, is if we're going to spend a federal public dollar, it should benefit everybody equally. Um, resiliency, safety, uh, climate mitigation, energy efficiency, um, a real emphasis on multimodal. So it's like, hey, let's sh make sure we've got our, our, tr our, you know, our rail and our, um, and our freight and everything working in conjunction. Uh, and the, uh, and the eligibility of local governments, tribal governments, nonprofits, uh, private sector in many cases, uh, is going to require a lot of coordination. But but in a lot of ways, it's almost this bill was written for Alaska. I mean, we hit uh, all of these things. The fact that uh, our tribes are eligible for almost everything in here. Um, it's, it's designed for historically underserved communities in the country, for, for places that don't have broadband, uh, for places that don't have um, basic transportation infrastructure. So uh, for places that are being affected by climate. So I mean, the whole theme of this thing is, is, is really, we should do well, we should be very competitive, uh, but it's gonna take a lot of, a lot of coordination uh, to do that. And so the governor's office uh, starting that process. And again, I think we're, we have to focus initially on, on this budget cycle um, but we've talked about, you know, what sort of working groups, what sort of we're going to be standing up a broadband office um, to start that coordination on the broadband funding, because there's a lot of planning that has to go in before that funding will come. Um, but there will be other areas where that's probably a need, um, whether that's, you know, the rail belt utilities and what sort of energy projects. Um, I would just touch on one other example of that, one of those one of those it's due January 31st kind of things was for um, there, there's a bunch of money in here. Uh, the, the energy programs in here again, Senator Murkowski, you know, in her role over the last few years, uh, the energy and, and uh, the energy committee um, has been trying to get a lot of these energy programs passed and authorized for a long time. And this was a vehicle to do it. And so there's a lot of stuff in there that um, with Alaska in mind. So carbon sequestration, pilot programs, clean hydrogen, uh, all of this grid upgrade resiliency stuff, um, but it's going to require, um, um, you know, that again, those grants and those applications aren't necessarily coming from the state of Alaska. So it's gonna require all of us working together. So is that, I know probably went longer than you'd like, but. So I'm, I'm, if you want to, I'm happy to take a couple of questions or whatever you want to do, Robert. I know you're on a tight schedule. Sure. Yeah, it's, it's uh, miles uh, with an I, miles.baker at alaska.gov. And the other thing is in um, coordinating, um, you, know, you mentioned there's times where um, feedback from Alaska is going to be helpful. 
Yeah. Because that keep us Southeast Conference loop will notify the region to go get those letters and responses. Yeah, and and so so Neil's at at um at AML is doing a great job with that. You know, he's fired up a website. You know, we've talked about oh, should the governor have a website? But now everyone is clamoring to sort of be the place where all this information is. Um, Neil's has got a good a good start on that at at AML. I would encourage you guys to go to um, the you know. I think Congressman Young has started sort of a place on his website to track this. Uh, all of the federal, I, let me just say one other thing. The, from the White House uh, to all the federal agencies to at least this governor's office, but most governor's offices to then our state. So I, we have people at each of the state agencies that are dual hatting, you know, they're, they're the infrastructure coordinator person. So everyone sort of has a, a level, but I know, you know, Ashto and all, you know, whatever organizations, you know, NASBO and all these folks are putting, you know, the trade associations and, you know, HDR, like you've got some of these industry partners that are putting out analysis. It's almost too much when you're trying to just sort through it. But I think the dust is settling, and I really, I really think there'll be a lot of information available soon. That's that's less, seems less hectic and, and sporadic. All right. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. All right. So one last thing we want to do before we take off um, is take a quick look at some of these resolutions and the process that Southeast Conference uses is we use our committee structure where most of these um, have come up from, and then they go to the board of directors and they will either consider them, pass them or not, or send them back to the committee for more work. So we wanna ask this group, your concurrence on whether or not uh, these are things to move forward to the board or back to committee for, and we can take as much time as you want, or we can go straight to the whereas that be resolved and talk about the title and whereas, and tell me if this is on point. The first one that uh, Nathan's going to throw up on the screen, and they're all, you should have already seen them, but on the QR code, the third button says transportation resolutions. The first one is talking about the community transportation program. You just heard Miles say radically more funding available for a lot of these programs that DOT is going to have. Do we want to make a recommendation to the legislature, the DOT, that the, uh, the community transportation program be fully funded so that your projects that John Bullings we're working with you on to catalog and put to place are actually having a shot at funding from the state level. Um, there we go. We're going to put it right there. There's support funding for community transportation program. If you'd scroll down to the uh, therefore be it resolved. That. Well, it's down down the very, very bottom. There he goes right there. You can. Right there, the last bit for a bit, therefore resolved and further resolved. Is there any questions or objections? So let's say this fund this thing. Okay, we'll go to the next one. The next one is, you know what? The federal law that was passed says that um, they could directly fund them from the federal level instead of going through DOT. I like, you know, do you want the feds to do it or the state to do it? Or I like box D, which is all the above. So we want to, uh, it's been suggested that the conference urge the federal government because it's discretionary as far as we can tell at this point, they may or may not. Well, we're gonna say yes, send it directly to the communities. So that's the, uh, the resolution that supports direct funding to communities for transportation projects. Any questions or objections? Am I going too slow? Okay, all right, the next one. Now this one might take a little more, 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 uh, no, no, this is okay. This is, this is just supporting efforts to implement the Alaska electric or low emissions ferry. We've heard lots about that. Skagway has led the discussion. Judy has beat it into all of us where we can find support from the small state further south that uh, uh, is uh, akin to us. Judy, thank you for your efforts. You know, we're gonna give you a hard time for that. Okay, she said it's okay. There it is. That's about, about the size of, okay. So 
The therefore be resolved, Nathan, at the bottom of that says that um, we're going to recommend that. Okay. That it gets implemented. We heard from the director that some of these funds are going to be going through no foes in the near future and funding. We want to push that forward and get it going. So questions or objection? Not even Judy. Okay. All right. Well, you know, you're, you're a member now, so you actually have a voice in committee. That's right. That's right. We're going to refer you as Judy Thrustmaster of the Transportation Committee. All right. Next, the next resolution is, this is the one that might take a little more conversation. We have talked for a long time, AMHS reform. We had a three, four year project that talked about governance structure. Ultimately, what needs to happen is management by people of professional expertise. We recommended that a, a, a public corporation, so the state still had the control of that, would be the ultimate uh, entity. Um, go ahead and scroll down to the therefore be it resolved. The, um, the Amy Jess reshaping said, yeah, that may be true, but it's a little bit of a long leap from there to today and uh, folks are busy and that might be more than we can handle right now, which is why we've got Catherine and change, change management happening, which is very, very good. But the question is, is there training wheels to um, move that direction? Should it, and then this is not calling for the action to take place. This, this resolution is asking for an evaluation to reassign AMHS as an enterprise that goes, instead of being a line agency in transportation, it's a line agency under commerce. DOT has got expertise in roads, design, engineering, fantastic, all kinds of things. Not necessarily looking at uh, making coffee, beds, or um, you know, port changes. Um, and so the inherent enterprise expertise is the Department of Commerce, which could be a stopping point on its way to making an, a public enterprise, which would also be under commerce. So this is just calling for an evaluation of that to say, is this a, a good interim step? So the question here, and the board may send it back to the committee anyway, but is this a step we want to see evaluated? Well, I, I see a, a heads nodding here and thumbs up over here. We'll move it on to the board and see, um, but it seems like it's a, a, a good step that can be achieved instead of aspirational that might be a little bit harder. Next resolution, and it's almost, okay. This is one that's near and dear to my heart. Um, Multi-use waterfront infrastructure. Our small communities, they can't have a ferry terminal, a barge terminal, another terminal, and then a harbor and, we have to find ways to make these things multi-use, especially when the ferry only comes in once. A, how often does it come down to yours, Ben um, Vice Mayor? Yeah. So couldn't we use that for something else, perhaps? We've heard freight folks in some of these communities are challenged, not just Wrangell. Um, you know, so do we want to recommend that this be explored to, to have our ferry terminals become more multi-use? You know, it might even benefit Haynes, uh, you know, get a little more waterfront uh, exposure for Pass, pass. Of course, they destroyed half of the terminal there instead of um, keeping those cells going. But just as a case of example. So that's what this calls for, because many of our, if we can just focus on having really good working waterfronts, they can be a lot more multi-use. Probably would be a very big benefit to Yakutat as well. So objections or question? Shannon. You know, it, Amy just will always have first rights to use it. We'd hope they would use it. So this is not displace them at all. This is just like making sure that the community has some control and uh, multiple uses for infrastructure that's sitting idle in their, on the waterfront. Yes. Thank you. And, and all these things are really calling for the due diligence to see, but um, uh, thank you for that, that uh, word of wisdom. Manages our expectations too, and the pace, but thank you. Um, the next uh, resolution, it calls for, huh, this is another one. And this is, this, may, this is the last one. 
So as we've heard this week, uh, talking to our state leaders, our federal leaders, um, there's a lot of money coming down the pike. And it's a lot of money. Do we want it primarily to go to a lot of service for five years and then back to zero because the votes can't handle it? Or do we want to say maybe push back a little bit? Um, I don't need eight days of service every week to cake. You know, just give me the, the two that I need and use the rest of the money to build me a new boat that will last the next 50 years. And a boat that can actually get to cake. And boats that can actually get to cake. There's a concept too. Um, so this, this doesn't give a dollar amount, doesn't give a, um, all, don't use any of it on you know, operations. You want some of it to be used on operations. More importantly, you want uh, any monies that go to operations, displace general funds and then go to the stabilization fund, which I know Senator Stedman uh, talked about doing. So we very much support that idea, but just calling for a strategic balance with the, with the notion that we really want the money spent on investments that are going to serve us well for the next two generations. Yes. So I'd like for you to say it on that because the folks online don't uh, sure. sit here. Assembly, assembly, is, uh, assembly is not manufactured. Manufacturing is where we approve what hundred yeah. percent of our parts come from the United States. We'll get there. Okay, say that again, please. I just wanted to make sure that everybody checked when you talk about building ferries that you end up recognizing that there's Buy America requirements by American requirements, and they're now looking into the construction materials being made in America under the bill. Thank you. And we, again, thank you so much for being here. Uh, it really helps us with our ability to plan and to have access to great information. If we spend a billion dollars in the five years and we don't do anything different than what we're doing right now, guess what? We're going to be having this same conversation five years from now. I, a lot of you know me. I've been at this for 25 years. The only thing that I can say is, I told you so. That's not comforting, Dave. 25 years, it seems much longer. <laughs> um, need more work, or should we uh, advocate for a strategic balance between the operations and investment with a really strong emphasis on investment. Okay, thank you. Uh, Chair Watson, I know you've been uh, following pace, but not been able to on the screen because we keep bumping it off for our documents. Uh, Nathan, can you bring uh, Dennis back up on uh, this, the screen and see if he has any closing words for us? It's been so good to have you all here, and I hope you found value in this information. We've got folks that have come from from Seattle and from DC and from New Orleans and from New York and places all over. And we really, really appreciate that. Mr. Chairman. Well, thank you, Dave. This isn't the first time you've said, I told you so. So I, I do remember it a couple of times before, but uh, hey, I'm, I'm really glad we've had this conversation. Uh, all kinds of things happening. I think it, it's gonna take a little more time than we had here to make sense of all of it. And it, it usually does any, any one of these giant federal uh, pots of money that come online, it takes forever to figure it out. So uh, let's hope that we do it right. We have some really good opportunities. Uh, you know, I uh, there are things that I, I have near and dear to my heart. Uh, I, I think it was a 2004 Southeast Transportation Plan, you know, that said that we need to start thinking about you know, ferry runs and roads and the longevity of this system, you know, the sustainability of it. And I sure wish we could get back on that track and uh, so we could actually come up with things that, that we can look at 20 years down the road and, uh, and see progress instead of more of the same. So uh, with that being said, thank you to everybody that participated and to all the people in the audience that, uh, probably can't absorb anything more in their brain right now. <laughs> I know I'm about there and I got a more comfortable chair than you guys do. All right.
right, thank you. And thank you all so much for being here. Thank you to the sponsors that were here. Thank you to Central Council for providing this uh, facility and um, let us know how we can do better, how we can do more and how we can help you uh, achieve the goals that we have. And for our guests from out of town, thank you so very much, Bruce. Uh, you, we've been two years of wrangling, but it happened and it was worthwhile and we appreciate it. So thank you all and have a great rest of the day and um, we'll see you back soon. We do, a, we do an annual auction and uh, for our scholarships. I have a couple of phones here that uh, will go to the, the highest bidder or the owner, whichever comes first.